Hello? Hey, do you want to mute yourself, please? Everyone in the room can hear you and live stream. Okay. It's not on mute?
Thank you. 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 Thank or if the we just mean the people at home may not be able to hear until we can get it. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, we've got a student representative report. This is the May Club slides. Student Council had their student council elections on May 1st, and many students took the risk to put themselves out there as candidates for leadership positions. The 2023 2024 student council officers are as follows Our president is Elena Blazer. Our vice president is Grace Shamborek. Our secretary is Stephanie. Our treasurer is Faith Shamborek. Our public relations coordinator is Ali Yuma. I'm the senior board rep, and Nick here is our junior board rep. FBLA had their state competition on April 17th and 18th and had 15 competitors and two national qualifiers. Callie Gogan and Josie Sari, pictured at the top right, competed in graphic design and placed third at state. They will be competing down in Atlanta, Georgia at the national level this summer. They also held their end of the year banquet at the end of April and elected their new officer team for the next year. Those 10 members will be working this May and through the summer to complete chapter goals for the next school year. And then the Drama Club presented Our Town April 28th and 29th. And the performances were well received by the audiences and a reception was held to honor the club's 25th anniversary while welcoming back many drama alumni. The club will end the school year with electing new officers and holding a pizza party. And then members of the GSA participated in the Day of Silence on April 14th to raise awareness to LGBTQ plus discrimination within schools. Our GSA recently partnered with the GSA in California to exchange letters as pen pals. We sent out our first letters to them and they're eagerly awaiting their responses. And then they also elected their officer team for the 2023 to 2024 school year. And that's all that we have for this month. Any questions, comments, or concerns? I think so. Great job. Thank you very Great much. Job, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for Thanks coming. For coming. Okay. Next, we've got a reorganization of the board. So we need to elect the officials for the next year. Debbie, do you have a separate? Sheet for that there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Start off with the president. Nominate Quinn Garber. Nomination by Ken or Clint. Any other nominations? I'm going to nominate Ryan Balmer. Okay, Carrie. Nominate Brian. Okay. Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Okay. One more. Say it once more. Any other nominations? Got to say it three times, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll be closed nominations. Okay. Motion by Ken to close nominations. Second. And second by Brian. Okay. I'm going to put up some papers. There you go. There you go. Hey, Clint. Yep. How do you want me to send mine in? Send it uh, by you. How about you? Uh, yeah, you can do you can do that or text text message uh, if you want to text message Debbie or send it to me. How do you want to do that? 
Okay, sounds good. Just let us know which way you're doing it, I guess. I'll send it to Debbie. Okay. Ballot clerk. What's that? We can have somebody be ballot clerk. We have a column right here. We can have, have Debbie. Or have me and something, someone else is fine. That's a good lesson. And he takes so this away. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, Debbie, just before. Make sure you write one on for yep. his and just put it in or whatever you need to do. Okay. 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 Yeah. Sure. Both of them? Yeah, so Clint is how many? Clint has four and Brian three. So Clint is okay. So Clint has four, Brian has three. I just want to make sure I capture the others on here. And carry. Close nominations, that was by Ken and then by Brian, right? Correct, yep. Right. Great. Okay. All right. Okay, I think that's it for that. Move on to Vice President. Nominate Brian. Ken, nominating Brian. Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Ten? We'll be close nominations. Cast the unanimous ballot for Brian for vice president. Motion by Ken. Second, Second by Sarah. Close unanimous, unanimous nomination. Um, Debbie, do we have to do a roll call at the no, end? No, so I did it in the bottom. If you see the second part says to cast one, then you just you can just do a um, voice vote. Okay, okay. But did we need to do one on the prior one though? To do a to who the vote was? No, because you did it by paper. Okay. All right. Okay. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. No. Clerk. I will nominate Sarah to be the clerk. Nomination for Sarah. Nominated by Brian. Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Ken? We'll close nominations. Cast the unanimous ballot for Sarah for clerk. Motion by Ken. Second. Second by Emily. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Treasurer. And we'll nominate Ken to be treasurer. Ken, nominated by Brian. Any other nominations? I nominate Carrie. Carrie. Nominated by Chad. Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Any other nominations? I think I got all of them, right? Yep. <laughs> all right, we'll close close nominations. Need a motion to close nominations? Okay. All right. Chad, you can do the same same method. 
Ken, there was five and Carrie two. Okay. Thank you. Again. Yeah. All right. Okay, I think that's our, our board is set for the next next year. Thanks everybody. Um can you give Sarah yeah, um, uh, Clint, it says on the um, agenda that we have to alternative clerk, it says. Oh, yeah. Yep. Like your appointment. I agree. I think it was a point. Usually, we, usually we have a point an alternative in the past many years. I think it's typically been, been Debbie. Um, now that we've gone to DocuSign, usually in the past where we ran into the most challenge, I guess, with an alternative was... Um, if someone was on vacation and we had signatures that needed to happen, now that everything's moved to DocuSign, I, were you the alternative clerk last year? And then if, if the clerk is not able to attend a meeting, then yeah. the alternative would take the notes and check the minutes by themselves. Okay. That's what we've that's done. That's pretty much the only That's what we've done in the past. Um, do we need to um, make a motion? Yeah. Or a different motion. You're, you're, you're the president, you can make the appointment. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing. Okay. I, I guess, Debbie, you've done it in the past. I think you continue it for this year. And typically, when the, if the clerk is going to be gone, um, Debbie takes notes, but we can have someone else also uh, keep keep notes, mm -hmm. notes also. So I don't see an issue with that. Thanks, Debbie. Mm -hmm. All right. Regular meeting schedule. Yes, does anybody have any issues with the, uh, we continue to do the second Monday of the month, uh, and then there are a couple of meetings that we do, do move to the, um, to the third, you can see September is usually moved to the third Monday as well as October. I'm not sure what the Packer schedule looks like for this year. So. Yeah. At times we have we have moved some moved a meeting, but yeah. typically we try to hold to the hold of the schedule as is. I I move that we adopt the uh, meeting schedule as outlined in the agenda. Motion by Ken. I'll second Ken. Second by Brian. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Um, school board committee assignments. Um, this is not a voting topic. It's usually something that um, the president kind of picks out, but I look for guidance from, from you all. Uh, so this is not yet set. This is this was a recommendation that I initially made. So just hand these out. Chad, I'll try to, I know you're online, so or uh, dialed in, so I'll try to communicate there as well. Um, usually board members have anywhere from three to five kind of committees. And some of these committees meet on a, I'd say a more regular basis, and some don't meet uh, unless there's a particular reason, reason to do so. Um, so going down through, and, and of course, Adam and, and Jan no longer being on, um, you'll see a lot of uh, Emily and Carrie on here. So transportation, 
um, Emily and Carrie both on that one. Uh, curriculum, Emily, I tentatively put you on there. Uh, Carrie, I know you've had some interest in policy in the past, and that's that's probably one of the more um, regular ones that has attendance and has a lot of time. So um, I put you on that one and kind of was conscious of not putting you on a lot of others, knowing that that one takes up a, a fair amount. Um, compensation committee, uh, we right now are in the throes of kind of being done with, uh, hopefully through this meeting with some of the major compensation things for this upcoming year. Um, I put you on there. Uh, public relations, Emily, and then Chad, I had added you to that uh, public relations one. So that's with Emily, Sarah, and Chad now. Um, and then the only other change was on the joint uh, city and rec committee. And Emily, I put you on that one. Um, so this week, maybe, or over the next course of the next week, week and a half, if anybody has any that they, you know, especially, uh, you know, don't want to be on or want to be on, want to get to me, I'll take that into consideration. But this was kind of the first, first pass. So. So food service and athletic board. Yeah, those those we typically they're not like a committee. They're often just um, uh, uh, they're a liaison to kind of a board representative to sit on. So if there's discussions around food service, then Sarah has sit in on that. Okay. All right. What about if Jerry wants to talk like he did last year? How how are you gonna do that then? Sorry, say that again, Jerry. If Jerry wants to meet up with, like we did last year, how are we going to do that now? Jerry Monahan. Yeah. So I think that there probably is a topic that from last board meeting that needs to be discussed. So okay. I think Chad would probably want, Chad, are you suggesting that you want some assistance in that? Because there probably should be a meeting. Yes, I, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Reach out. Reach out to me and or Dean, um, Chad, and then we'll get the appropriate setup, whatever needs to happen there. Okay. Okay. Yep, thanks. Okay. So I'll make that note. Okay. Uh, next up, citizen participation. Debbie, do we have any? Yeah, I handed it to you when I walked up. Okay. Uh, Rachel Rudd. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> Hi. I'm Rachel Rudd. Um, I am a staff member at the high school and a parent of three kids that attend the district. Um, I'm not here to point fingers, to yell, to um, be upset. I only want to bring concern. Uh, a gun safe has been installed in our school about a week ago, and I, I feel uneasy. And I know it's a bad time. We have to prepare if the inevitable happens, um, but I am myself and other staff members are uneasy about the, where it's located. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm nervous. That's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, take your time. I feel that it makes me feel uneasy to look at it, of course. Um, but if, if, you, if anything were to happen, Officer Kuhn is down the hall and around the corner. And she's supposed to be the only one that knows the code. So I would feel safer or, or less nervous if it was located closer in her room or in the office. Um, that's my suggestion. I'm, I'm not saying to move it. I'm, I'm just here to express my concerns on it because it makes me feel uneasy as other staff members but i can't speak for them but um that that's it okay thank you thank, thank, you, thank, you, rachel. thank you thank you thanks rachel okay that's it for citizen participation next we'll uh need to approve the board uh the minutes from the april 17th meeting <laughs> Thank you. 
I move to approve the minutes of the first meeting. Motion by Ken. Second. Second by Chad. Any other discussion? All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, financial report. Okay, if you take a look at your financial report, cash on hand as of April 1st, 2023, in the amount of $8,054,512. You can see there's a list of April receipts in the total of $1,323,279. A couple of the receipts that I'll bring to your attention. One is under property tax. That's the third of four payments. You also see there's an ESSER 3 as well as an ESSER 2. The ESSER 2, this is actually the final amount and it's now closed and the ESSER 3 will close at the end of the 2023-24 school year. Also notice at the bottom of those receipts, we have more than $13,000 in bank interest. So once in a while, there's a positive to the high interest rates. <laughs> um, looking at April disbursements, in the amount of $2,120,448, which left us with cash on hand of $7,257,344. Looking then at May disbursements in the amount of $437,919, May receipts of $339,307, which left cash on hand as of today, May 8th, 2023, $7,158,732. Questions on that first page. Mm -hmm. You move to the different funding accounts. Fund 21 is broken into three different areas. One is the Veterans Memorial. You can see that we had $38 in interest as a change, which left a balance of $29,015. Second part of Fund 21 is the Scholarship Fund. We had donations in the amount of $1,550, interest of $621, leaving a balance of $159,901. You can see there, there's a breakdown that Kim's provided of the amount that's held in WISC, which is an investment account, and the remainder, which is left in the bank. And then the final part of Fund 21 is the activity fund. There was $21,738 in receipts, expenditures of $34,886 leaving a balance of $285,514. Again, Kim shared 100,000 of that is in the CD and $185,514 is in the bank. Debt service, 3839, there was $529 in interest, balance of 163,837. And again, you can see the amount that's held in the WISC investment and how much is in the bank. Capital expansion, fund 41, there was $79 in interest. Total is $135,072, of which $100,000 is in a CD and $35,072 is held in the bank. Capital Improvement Trust Fund, Fund 46. There was $308 in interest. Leaves a balance of $2,997,333, of which a vast majority is held in the WISC account investment and 94,134 is held in the bank. Capital referendum account, fund 49, $27,325 in interest. We had to pay for a land survey of 13,388. And that leaves a balance of $37,714,367, of which it's held in the WISC investment account at this point. Going to fund 73, employee trust, $4,123 in interest, leaves $1,541,153 currently in a balance. And Kim is looking at different ways in the future to invest that. Questions on the funds? The CDs that we hold, do we try to keep those local? We actually met with WISC and I'll kind of get a crack at this and then Kim, you can jump in. But um, I think there was local options and then there was some that were not but then you also had it in shorter CD timelines and then longers as well, so that you have kind of finding a bridge between better investment and then also a bit of um, fluidity that you can use it as needed. Lettering. How'd I do? <clears throat> Pretty 
did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we told WISC of all the banks that are located here in Okana Falls, and they reached out to them personally with a phone call or an email if they had their contacts. So we made sure to um, do the local ones within the district. And then once they went out to bid, because it goes out like nationwide, we <coughs> tried to pick uh, local, meaning Wisconsin ones first, and then branched out from there. Ken? I'd move that we accept the financial report and uh, payment requests in the amount of $1,087,566. Roll call vote, please. I need a second. I'll second. Motion by Ken, second by Sarah. Sarah, when you're ready, if you wouldn't mind getting a roll call. Uh, yeah. Hill? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Emily? Yes. Ken? Yes. Clint? Yes. Chad? Yes. Yes. Um, Brian? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sarah, yes. <laughs> you there in the blue. <laughs> Good job, Sarah. Hey, thanks. I'm new at those. And, 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 and Shindle? Yes, I said yes. Oh, okay. I said Sarah, oh. yes. <laughs> I think. Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Most carried seven out. All right. Reports and discussions. Next one on the agenda is CCA annual board meeting. So, this is something that will take place on June 7th at 6 p.m. Um, at CISA 8 in Chillet, and the intent is to identify a member of the board to represent the school district of Okano Falls. The meeting will be 45 to 60 minutes, um, so we're asking that somebody have an interest in that. This is just for this one meeting, it's not, yeah. we're not ready to be. Correct, we're not up for the board of control rotation yet, it's just for this one meeting. I'd be interested in going. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Do we need a motion for that? I'll I don't, register. I'm assuming that we don't. So, okay. I'll register you, Sarah, and then you'll get information from them. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for doing that, Sarah. Okay. 2023 high school graduation report. Mr. Moore. <coughs> Congratulations, Emily and Carrie. Thank you. Thanks for stepping up. Um, commencement 2023 is less than three weeks away, right around the corner. And so this year we have 112 students that are on pace to be walking across that stage. And so um, uh, we've got a number of events that will come up in the next couple of weeks for our seniors that I'd like to advise you of and invite you to attend a number of these. Um, the first one will be um, this Wednesday, actually, 6 o'clock in the PAC. It's our Senior Scholarship Awards. And so um, a number of different national, state, and lots of local scholarships are presented. Our community is very, very good to our students, um, very generous. And so if you're able to attend that, please do. And several of these are also live streamed, so uh, they're also going to be on uh, Panther News. Um, so that's our first event, would be um, scholarship boards. Then, uh, Dan, just one second. Yeah. I just wanted to make, um, uh, I'm unfortunately going to be out of town. Uh, Ken attends because he gives away an award for uh, one of the other scholarships. Um, for the new board members, there is a board scholarship that the board members make just their own monetary donation to. And so Ken will be uh, uh, giving that giving that out at that event. So um, the next thing then, so that would be this week. And then um, in two weeks, then our seniors will take their finals on Monday and Tuesday, the 22nd and 23rd. And then on Wednesday, that'll be the final day for seniors at the high school. Um, they'll report about mid-morning, they'll go through a checkout process, and then we will have a cookout for the seniors and their families. It's always been a nice event. Um, board members, you're welcome to attend if you'd like to. Um, please uh, just give us a call, let us know if you're planning to attend. And then in the afternoon, we'll have our senior awards, and that'll start at 1.30 in the PAC, um, probably about 90 minutes. And so that'll be where 
Um, there'll be lots of different department awards and other school awards that will be presented to our seniors. Um, that will also be live streamed. Um, the following day then, um, May 25th, Thursday, May 25th, will be our commencement practice, and that will be in the morning. Um, students will report by about 8 o'clock, and they'll have a picture taken of themselves in cap and gown. And that's something where um, we need to see if there's some interest in having one or two board members that would like to present diplomas at commencement. Because um, if you're interested in doing that, then we would ask you to come to the practice on Thursday in order to get a picture um, of you giving the diploma to the graduates. So um, you have to be into the, to the field house about 10 to 8. It usually takes about 90 minutes or so. So are there any board members that would like to to volunteer to, to do that and then of course at commencement um to be on stage handing out diplomas and i plan on being there this year i don't know if anybody wants family. to here I, is a family can. I can you don't but, have to but i mean right. if, if you I just don't know if you want a blubbering mother up there <laughs> 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 so yeah we'll discuss if you want okay later but uh, probably not just okay. because it's an emotional time and I don't think it's real professional <laughs> to be crying up on this stage the whole thing. <laughs> Does anyone else potentially want to? I did. I, I have a comment. Um, I mean, if Carrie, if you decide not to, Ken, have you had the opportunity to be up on stage in all the years of service that you provided? Uh, many years ago, I did. Uh, but this year, I probably am not. I, I usually try to attend mm -hmm. graduation, but this year I'll be attending graduation over in Marshfield. Okay, because mm -hmm. usually I see you there, but yeah. I'd like to have you on stage for the years of service you put in. But thank you. Um, grandson's graduating. I guess you could miss it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll allow it. Okay. Okay. Um, what Thursday is the practice? It'd be Thursday the 25th. I can do it if nobody else wants to. Well, I, I will, or I'm, I'm planning on it for sure, Chad. So if okay. you want, if we have two up. I'm totally good with, good with Eric. Well, I mean, anybody can on the board. Usually, we, I think we've usually never done more than two. So, yeah, Chad, if you're interested, that'd be great. I mean, both of us could do it. Uh, yes, that would be. Okay, great. That's a just. Uh, because it won't involve me anymore, but uh, uh, you know, other graduations I've been to uh, be because of the, the work. <laughs> Basically, I, I I try to attend because I feel that's kind of some of my uh, reward for the work that we do on the board. And other schools I I have seen where the entire board is invited, or as many as can make it, uh, to, to not necessarily everyone uh, presenting. Uh, or the, uh, the diplomas, but at least be a, be up there, be observers and yeah, that's, that event. I, All like sitting on the stage? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we may have to expand the stage stage a little bit to fit everybody on, but I think I, that would I would be the suggestion that I would make to consider going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And so then um, commencement will be Sunday the 28th, 2 o'clock. Um, we will again have uh, recognition of the class of 50 past. They'll be arriving about one o'clock for an informal reception, and then they will come in and sit just behind the graduates. Um, we actually have, uh, who was the class president of the class of 1973 that's going to say a few words at nice moment. So um, it'll be very nice. And then um, some of the uh, members of the class of 50 past have asked if they could present the diplomas to their grandkids or have you. So it's always really nice to include them. And that will be live streamed again. So um, we're excited. This has been uh, an interesting journey for this class. They started off as freshmen being sent home in the spring. And they had an interesting sophomore year. And fortunately, they've been able to have some two really nice. Um, Two, two nice years to wrap up their high school years for them. It'll be a good celebration for them. Have some questions at all? Excellent. Thank Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Uh, District Administrator's report. Hi. 
I have it here somewhere. The first part is the month of review, uh, taking a look at some of the things that have been going on this past month. Um, a lot of people don't recognize with a school district our size, we have a tremendous number of activities and we're kind of making fun of the weather recently with the track that we've had to cancel. Um, but when we run a track meet, it takes a significant number of people to make that work. And Jerry Monahan and John Dunks as athletic and activities directors are, are always scrambling to get people. Um, so we just want to say thanks for our staff, um, parents, community members who jump in and help with that. Without your assistance, those activities don't happen. Um, the other thing that I want to say is quite often um, folks are able to go and watch their children participate. Um, in some cases, our staff is not because they're helping for your children. So thanks for those folks for, for giving of themselves. Um, during this last month, new board members and their mentors, we appreciate the training that you all went to. Um, Wisconsin Association of School Boards puts on a training each year in Green Bay. Um, members of our team went and attended that. Also, a big thanks for all the folks who helped put together the elementary ag night. Um, really neat activity, very well attended by our students, uh, their parents, families, community members. Um, I just happened to be standing next to one person as they were purchasing their plot for the community garden. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, had a chance to go do a listening session with our transportation team. Um, listen to some things that were going well, also share some ideas uh, back and forth as to what we can do as we continue to try to get folks to join our team. We talked about maybe trying to put together a video with a couple of our new drivers, um, showing folks that no, we are not driving stick shifts anymore. The buses are automatics. Um, and it is something that you know, people out there can absolutely do if they put their mind to it. Um, we did a staff recognition banquet. Um, appreciate uh, Debbie and Terry and Stephanie working together to make that happen. Um, we had members of our of our staff that attended to honor the folks um, for their years of service as well as to honor our retirees. We had that um, in Green Bay over at the Vandervest and it was really nice and people enjoyed themselves. I uh, had a chance to uh, participate in a couple different concerts um, one middle school band, there was not a seat in the house that was not taken. It was a neat activity. Um, our kids did a nice job. Um, also had a chance to drive the bus for uh, choir students at the high school over to Gillette. And um, I can never remember the name of that high school group, if it's the, the Cantable or? The uh, Chamber Singers. Chamber Singers, thank you. <laughs> and. Uh, it was interesting because I had a chance to listen to some other districts and then listen to our ladies. And of course I'm biased, um, but if I wasn't, I would tell you they did an absolutely awesome job. Uh, it's always interesting to watch the judges. Um, when our ladies were done, this gentleman went up there and he was just absolutely fired up to tell them how nice a job they did. So I wish I could have taped it, but I was in the back and. I couldn't hear very well, but I asked the ladies when they got on the bus and they were pretty excited about the positive feedback that they had gotten. Um, had a chance to participate in High School Trades Day and social media was was pretty excited with all the different uh, equipment that they saw going on over at the, the high school. And this is an activity that has run now for a couple of years. There's a tremendous amount of effort that our, our staff puts in to make this happen. Um, somebody asked me, when does the planning start? And I said, well, it's actually happening during the trades day for the next year. Um, extremely well attended. This doesn't happen if we don't get the support of all those different uh, companies and organizations that come and participate. It's a win-win because obviously um, our staff puts this together for our students to get some different opportunities. It's also great for the employers because they're looking at having the opportunity to meet potential future employees or potential future young people that are interested in um, getting into apprenticeships. So awesome activity. Skills USA, um, we had some students that were participatory in both Skills USA and FBLA. 
and I have way too many documents here in front of me. But I will start with the FBLA. Um, as was talked about, we had two young ladies, uh, Callie Ganyu and uh, Josie Sari, that are going on to nationals. And then we had four young gentlemen that did well in Skills USA. And if I can find that document, I'll be able to tell you their names. Uh, I might have to come back to that. Um, but you as a board, um, we're going to move forward again with what we've done in the past, which is um, identify $200 for each one of these students that goes to a national um, and to help defray some of the costs because they look to raise money to attend the national event. And both the Skills USA students and the FBLA students will be here next month. Um, you'll get a chance to meet them and they can tell you a little bit about um, the events that they participated in. Um, but I just want to give you a heads up tonight on that. And then moving on to a transportation update, unless you have any questions on the month in review. Just, uh, would make one, <clears throat> one comment at the, uh, the trade fair talk to Art Paulson, who's a retired tech ed teacher. And one of the things that struck him, he said, was the number of presenters or representatives of the businesses that were here who are graduates of our tech ed program. Absolutely. Um, it's uh, It reminds us how small the world is sometimes mm -hmm. and, yeah. and the connections. And thank you for getting the light off me for a second because then it gave me a chance to find my four young people. Um, so we had uh, four young people who will be attending the Skills USA Nationals from June 19th to the 24th in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Devin Dorn and Colton Krieger will be competing in the additive manufacturing competition. Bryce Christensen competing in sheet metal and Grant Bushy competing in motorcycle service technology. So along with the two ladies, those four gentlemen will be coming in, talking with you next month. Uh, transportation update. So last month we talked about an individual who has come forward that has some interest. Um, they are continuing moving forward. They're currently working on their written tests. We anticipate they'll be involved in the driver training this summer. Um, unfortunately, they have a full-time job, but they will be able to assist us with trip support. So supporting athletic events and things like that. Um, a little bit about employee engagement. We had our second advisory team meeting this past week. Um, in between the first and the second meeting, folks went back to their staff and asked for feedback on things that are going well, as well as things that we need to work on. And then we asked them what did they see as potential um, roadblocks that are getting in the way of improvement? And then what are some ideas that they have? And so we received that feedback and now everybody in that advisory group is wading through that information and we're trying to identify trends. We're coming back together on June 7th to share trend feedback um, and trying to identify what do we feel we can most effectively uh, have a positive impact on as an advisor group. So that's coming. Um, we also wanted to share with you information about a non-district sponsored trip to, a no to New Orleans. And to kind of put this in perspective, we do something like this at the middle level with a trip to uh, Washington, D.C. But I'd like to learn a, bit, a little bit more about the high school option. Yeah, great. Well, I'm Lauren Seidel, for those who don't know me, and I'm the high school band director here. And um, I have a couple other words about student achievements, if that's okay for me to share with you. Um, so we had our band version of the choir festival that, thank you, Dr. Hess, for driving the choir over. That was wonderful. Um, that we host here and we will continue to be hosting here because we have the best facilities out of everybody, all the other schools. So I love that we get to host it here and show off what we have. Um, and we performed two pieces that the band is working on and the three judges gave us the highest score that we get. So I was, I was very proud of that. Um, there is a an honors recital competition that would be no. Um, high school puts on and they invite all of the students in northeastern Wisconsin and part of upper Michigan to compete and they have to record a solo like a pretty hard difficulty level and send it in and only 12 people of all of those are selected to perform in an honors recital and three of our students decided to send in a video and all three of them are picked out of 
the whole area. Only 12 students are picked from all those videos and our three get to perform. So that is nice. something mm. I'm very excited about. Um, and I have a lot of students who've been seeking opportunities outside of our room to grow on their musical skills. Um, one of the most prestigious groups in the whole state is the like um, WSMA, Wisconsin um, School Music Association, puts on an honor band and only like the best students um, in the state are able to audition. And we had two audition and one of them made it in. So that is also something I'm very excited about. 1,200 people audition and only about 300 people get in. And of those 1,200, it is like the highest of the high students in the state and band. And the choir as well does it. So I'm super excited about that. And then lastly, um, they auditioned. I had four students audition for a community band that is audition based in out of Lawrence University, which is students from the Hope Box Cities area and the Green Bay areas all auditioned for it and all four made it in. <laughs> and then this weekend, I had two students audition for the St. Norbert Youth Orchestra, which is just the whole Green Bay area. And both of them made it in that as well. And the director for the band and the orchestra is the same director. And he <coughs> said that the O'Connell Falls band has been the discovery of the century. <laughs> so I'm very excited to hear that. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'm really proud of them and of what we're doing. It's really exciting. Um, our trip is, thank you so yes. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our trip is something I'm very excited about. I I love to travel and it's important that the students have these opportunities to grow together and to make music in other places. So although it's not technically a school sponsored trip, um, it is very much school supported. Danny Smith has been working with me to hammer out some details that we come upon and our school nurse has been aiding with the medical forms and that side of it. As we go along, we are working with the travel company that I have been working with since last August to put it together. We'll be going to New Orleans in the first week of summer, um, June 6th through the 9th, and we will be flying out right on Tuesday. We'll be at the Milwaukee airport at three in the morning for some good old band and choir bonding time. And um, we'll be in New Orleans for three days, and some of the things we'll be doing are performing in Jackson Square, going to Loyola University for clinics. Um, we're doing a New Orleans School of Cooking excursion where they'll be showing us how to make jambalaya, <coughs> foster, gumbo, the whole the whole ordeal. We'll be going on a steamboat tour. Um, we'll see some jazz performances and going to the Mardi Gras Museum, going to Jazz History Museum. So I'm just, I'm super excited to take the students on and, and I'm hoping that every other year we'll be taking a big trip like this. So. I just want to share what we've what we've been working. I'm getting very proud of it and very excited. I just want you to know what's happening. Thank you for so all awesome. that. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. And the last item in the district administrator's report is vaping concerns. So here a while back I had an opportunity to talk with board members in regards to um, the vaping situation. We put out a a communication to families with some data um, that we had been receiving um, both through the um, the high school level um, health curriculum and then also terry help me with the name of the youth risk behavior survey thank you the youth risk behavior survey which is something that i know in the past has been questioned um, but this is an example of some of the data that we had was from that and over and above that the question has been posed um, what else can we be doing and so i want to let both danny smith and john dunks know um, my appreciation for their willingness to take a lead on this as well as terry olson um, working with members of our staff the intent is to pull folks together here in june july and august um, for a couple meetings to try to review information um, reach out to, we've already started reaching out to other districts, asking them some of the things that they've been doing, ask them how's, how's that working. The intent then is to put together some potential courses of action um, and then bring back to you in August um, a recommendation of what are some things that we can potentially be doing as a school district. One of the things that I'm going to throw out there is this is a, it's an ongoing challenge that I think everybody needs to be involved in. And 
it's it's not something that I think a school um, on their own can solve, but we can potentially be part of the solution. So I think whatever it is that you know comes forward to you, um, it's it's understanding that you try to do what we can do for the things that we're involved in, but then we're we're also going to be reaching out as we did with that last communication we gave. Um, resources for families to take a look at and understand what should they be aware of and what can they be potentially working with their children on as it relates to this topic. So just wanted you to be aware that the wheels are starting to turn behind the scenes. So Dean, is it your intention to have something implemented? So then we go into the school year next year and we have a solid plan. We have a policy in place. Is that whether or not it'll be ready right away at the beginning of the year, I don't know, but I just put down the fall as a as a goal. So trying to be thoughtful of people's time. So they're about, I mean, this is the time of year where quite honestly, people are they're they're pretty spent. And so the intent is to see if we can get them to come back here in June or July and start having those conversations. Um, and then I'm I'm throwing out August in hopes that we can get that information together by then. Uh, depending on what that course of action entails, depends on how quickly we can turn around and implement. It. So, you know, and one example is looking at, do you install some type of vape sensors in your buildings? Um, one of the things, the reason I say I'm not sure is because if you do in fact decide that's something that you want to go with, um, we'll have to see what's the, the lag time in order to get it back in. Um, we might get lucky and we're able to get it in few weeks or sometimes can take longer than that. But I um, want to try and get some data for you because we're not we're not recreating the wheel. I mean ultimately right. there are folks that have gone before us and we're interested to find out what devices have they used, how how did that work, um, what are lessons learned, what might they do differently if they were doing it again now. So our policy right now does that line up with if we were to take action that way or do we have to look at revising that policy i would have fully expect that there'll be some type of language revision required yeah okay it's addressed in our policy mm -hmm. along with There's There's tobacco, tobacco and things tobacco like that policy. but, yeah. but if, you, <clears throat> if you if you go to implement something like this you can anticipate you're going to need some policy language because how it is that that you're going to implement it will need some level of of language to support it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, support the what happens when you do detect. Right. So your intent at this point is pull that team together, do evaluation of what's the recommendation, talk to other schools, et cetera, pull all that together, come back with a recommendation, and then um, if one of the actions is to install and to do so, determine, I mean, at that time, I think we should have what the you know, what is lead times? What does that look like? What would it be to install if, if that is the route that the, that the team team goes? But I think the board, and at least speaking for myself, I would want to see if we are going to go that sort of route. I'd like to see it as close to the beginning of the school year as possible. Agreed. So. so, so I from other schools that I was checking into, um, there is one brand that one school does, and that's Heartland Business. And they said it's pretty accurate, but with that one, you have to update it every year. Um, that superintendent said that in one week when they installed it, they had eight people, and now they're down to zero. I talked to another person. They had 15 students got caught in the first two weeks, and now they're maybe down to one every month. And then <clears throat> that one is uh, Halo. And that Halo, that updates it by itself. And you can program it for certain words um, like noise. So if some going on in the locker room or bathroom where a kid is crying or upset or a fight, you will detect it. So I can give you guys some more information on that and what Brandon 
and how they use it and how it helped their school eliminate beacon in the school. I think Chad brings up a good point. I mean, it's as much, once it's installed, it's as much deterrence as it is, is anything. I know, I think Heartland, we've, we've used, we use for other things, so. Well, and you can imagine there'll be members of our team you're looking at. Uh, we have nurses that have shown interest in participating, um, some of our teaching staff. So I'd, I'd like to get Danny and John a chance to get those folks together and right. see where it takes us. Not only would we have to make a plan for that, but then it's the whole intervention piece too, you know, and intervention, then discipline, but mm -hmm. I think it's, yeah, it's a lot that goes into it. So I would hope that Jamie would be involved in that. Piece so too. if you don't mind, we have a, we have a tool available to us currently um, that I paid for out of my uniform allowance, that was $38, <laughs> a precision metal detector. Um, and we were testing it today just to see what its capabilities were before we invested in, um, I've done a lot of research on other schools and what SROs are using. A lot of them are using your handheld metal detectors now, um, just because it's non-invasive, it's on the outside of the body, um, and it can be a persuasive tool um, to convince them like, listen, we know there's something there and they give, they give it out. Right. Um, and today um, it was accurate within two inches when we tested it. Um, so there are tools that are available to us that are non-invasive, that are cost effective, um, that will also have a deterrence effect um, because we're playing around with it you know, with other students as they're, what are you doing? Cause they're all interested. Can <laughs> Let's see where I can hide something. Let's check the eyelets on the shoes. Let's check the, um, so it was extraordinary. It, it was actually far more accurate than I was expecting for $38. <laughs> um, but there are things available to us that we would want to, you know, check Neola to check. I mean, this, I haven't found anything that says it's a violation of anything, but we would still want to make sure that it's aligned with our own policies before we're using it for real. Right. Um, but the, I mean, that we wouldn't have to wait on. We can, we can start doing, looking into stuff like that now. Okay. And it's, um, it's going to have a deterrent effect just because I'm sure the five kids that knew about it today started <laughs> talking about it immediately. Okay. Um, and they don't need to know that we don't, aren't going to use it yet. <laughs> okay. so it's, bluffing is half the game. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Jamie does have to be a member of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's all I have. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Move on to old business uh, donations. Asking the board to review the donations and okay. consider accepting them. Okay. A motion to accept the donations. So moved. Motion by Ken. I'll second. Motion by Sarah. Any other discussion? Just a thank you to everyone out there again who. Uh, sent in the donations, always appreciated by the district. That, that top one there, just for your information, uh, come, coming from the National Bay Organization, this actually was a grant written by uh, a student, Julie Holly. She participated in this with Washington Leadership Conference last year. One of the requirement, uh, the requirement, I mean, the expectation of those kids is that they go home and uh, and develop a living to serve grant, basically a service a service program, and this grant was to you know, fulfill that requirement. And she's and the grant is going to be used at the community garden. Oh, oh awesome! Very cool. Okay, all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. All right. Capital referendum update. I wanted to do a reminder that uh, tomorrow evening there'll be a community engagement presentation that will be taking place at 6 p.m. at Washington Middle School. This is in relation to um, the capital projects 
uh, related to the referendum. So be an update on the secure entrances and the roof work, as well as the design work up to this point for the new middle school. Um, as you can imagine, we continue to meet as a design team, as well as user groups to try to refine the plan. Um, we are looking forward to, uh, as we get closer and closer to um, the end of this design process, um, starting to gain some idea as to what's happening in other projects around the state for bids, because as you can imagine, that will help us to start to understand what's happening financially and kind of guide us as to the design work if we can continue moving forward if we need to make some adjustments because obviously we need to stay within budget when we get to the final product so that's kind of an update so again tomorrow night 6 p.m at washington mill school I encourage people um, in the community to come and attend and get a chance to hear what's been going on and give their feedback ask questions are we going to live stream that tomorrow uh that's the intent yep. yes okay thanks Corey. thank you um one thing that i had with the referendum um secured entrances i know that those are coming sooner than the middle school um have we included law enforcement in reviewing those plans before we start no no we haven't um we have been involved obviously with law enforcement um relative to the entrance needs uh, in fact, Jamie, I think you were part of doing one of the videos. Um, we were trying to explain to people what the issues and the needs were. Um, so we didn't go out and, and get a bunch of people together because, quite honestly, the process is pretty straightforward. Um, the, the needs are identifying what it is that needed to be done from a physical process involve technology because it it's going to um a significant change and, and we have a group of people right now i think corey i just saw you're scheduled to do your fourth meeting is starting to develop um, standard operating procedures relative to the electronic and what it is that we can be doing with the technology that we have if we ever have a problem we need to implement gotcha. um, so a big part of that right now is you know when we hit a panic button um, in the past, a panic button would simply lock down a building. Now, a panic button has just an unbelievable amount of capability. So, trying to understand, you know, do we send those phone calls then immediately to law enforcement? Who all gets contacted and how do they get contacted? Um, and trying to develop what it is that we want that to do and then starting to practice it. Um, to go with what you're talking about, um, we actually had a significant um, amount of people that came together at the county. John Spice coordinated it. Um, we did that about, it's probably been six or eight weeks ago. And he's actually bringing everybody back together in the first week of June um, to reflect on the audit process. And I call it an audit because it was essentially an opportunity for all the districts in Ocala County to take a look at not just you know what have you done from a preparation standpoint um what have you done from a proactive standpoint but then what are you doing on the back side of a, of a situation if it were to occur um how are you trying to get accountability of, of all of your kids after an event um how does transportation play into that um and it's, as you can imagine it's it's a monster of a plan to try to put together and you have all the different entities, not just the schools and law enforcement, but you've got um, folks from emergency management, um, fire department, EMS, all trying to come together. And, you know, it creates situations like how we communicate. Um, Debbie and, and several other folks just came together, Corey, um, to take a look at our, our handheld radios and recognizing that we need to be thoughtful not just within our district but how are those going to work with the folks that we're trying to work with through law enforcement the ms and fire so that process is causing us to bring more people in mm -hmm. yep i just want to make sure that their response would be appropriate and they're up to speed on what the changes that we're making yep. so then they're 
response is correct. You know, like in the bank, we always have to, um, if we've made any structural changes, we need to report those to the county because the county has blueprints and yep. they would know where to breach. And well, and that's that's actually one of the things that that we just gave them because um, some of the ones that we had were outdated, and so um, I think we had a bit of a a challenge when we first shared them for whatever reason and didn't get through to, to John, but then on our second or third try, we finally got it, got it through. So, um, but it, it's it's an overwhelming amount of um, of work to try to get your brain wrapped around. But the good news is we're starting to identify gaps and things that we need to adjust. I mean, you don't think about them until you sit down and somebody asks you, is there a way that law enforcement can get into your building right now? And we had actually addressed that a couple of years ago already where they have, um, they have fobs in each one of the, the squads to get in. But um, there were other questions that they asked that we didn't have a good answer for. And so we're continuing to work on it. Okay. Yeah, I'm capital referendum. That's it. Uh, school resource officer rifle safe at OFHS. So we had a situation where <laughs> Detective Kuhn had brought forward a request. We brought it to you, the board. Um, you, the board, appreciated what she presented, and ultimately um, the decision was made to move forward. A question was posed here recently since the last board meeting of had you the board taken action to put that in detectives uh, office or classroom or not and if you had a chance to go back and take a look at the video um, I don't know that there was a definitive as to where it would go I think initially it was thought that was brought up do we put that in your classroom or in your office um, then we had you all had conversation and I felt that it was kind of left up to you and the high school administration to determine that you all hadn't gone through and, you know, had those conversations yet. So I guess what I would ask is that you kind of walk through with the board after you walked out that night, what were the next steps that took place up to today? And then I think the next question is, um, do you all want to have further conversation about potentially doing something similar in other buildings? So, Detective Kuhn, they're all yours. I apologize for my casual attire. I came from the 12 youth softball fields and I didn't want to change. Um, Forgive it. So, thank you. Thank you. I don't think I'm um, <laughs> So, I was under the understanding that it was the motion was not tied to a specific location either, and that we should evaluate as a team to where the best the needs of the building were and then um, confer with Dean for before we installed it. So that's what we did. Um, Mr. Smith, Mike Bushy and I met initially. Um, Mr. Moore was like, I'm not gonna be here. So I trust you guys to, to consider it. And so the three of us met, um, we, can we considered my office um, my office has kind of a revolving door, um, including the staff members a lot of times are in my office just because it's tied to the washroom or the laundry room. Um, so that laundry room is in between my room and Mr. Taylor's. So if Mr. Taylor has a class, people are using mine to go through. Um, and then we talked about how I'm at one end of the building and that my room changes sometimes depending on the needs of the teaching or the teaching needs or the educational needs. So I've been in three different places in four years and we kind of went like, does it make sense to put it in my office if my office isn't gonna be my office next year? And where would it best be suited um, for the goal of making, I think, accessibility for everybody. So we considered that it might not just be me. If I'm not in that building or if I'm taken out and the county is coming in to assist and they need extra ammunition, they're gonna be able to access that. Or if um, one of them is at one of our events because their kids are here and they're not on duty and something happens, everybody within the county, because it's biometric, um, we're gonna be able to store up to 100, which we don't have that many, so we don't need that much, but um, we chose a safe that would have capabilities for every law enforcement officer in the county to be able to access that at any time. 
So if for whatever, we're trying to, you know, make sure that we're prepared no matter the scenario. So we went through, we talked about having it down by where our crowds are. Um, and we kind of ruled that out just because um, we don't want it so visible or accessible that we're freaking people out when they're coming in for sporting events or that it's tempting to too many people to ask questions or just kind of making it, we don't want it to draw attention, but we want it to be accessible. So um, we chose the 300 hallway. Um, and the reason we chose that is because there's an alcove there that heads into um, the courtyard. And in that alcove, there's no, um, there's no lockers, there's no student lockers. Um, it's out of the way. So if they're bringing things into the gym, that it's off the side of where their path is. So it's not going to be in the way. It's really not that big. Um, it can fit three rifles and then extra equipment. Um, if it's a deck, super decked out rifle, it's probably only going to fit two comfortably, but we don't really need 308s. So we're just going to use regular rifles that we would need that are light in the sake of an emergency. Um, it is accessible three ways. So we chose one that also has um, tamper proof audible alerts on it. So if it's shaken or if somebody tries to get in um, using any amount of excessive force, we, we lengthen the bolts. So it's a four inch bolt going into the wall to make it more secure there. And then if you are shaking it or somebody is shaking it or can't get into it, that doesn't either have the key, the biometric or the code because you could get into it three different ways. Um, it's going to give an audible alarm sound that is visible. I tested it. Um, you can hear it all the way in the 500 hallway. Um, so it's it's a pretty loud alarm if somebody were trying to get into it it would take significant effort and lengthy effort for somebody to to get into this safe um we we put it slightly into the hallway so if we were taking fire we would be able to access that um and not be visible directly from the hallway and then um realizing that it's more centrally located than either end of the building and if there was something across the school in the 500 hallway, you would be able to cut through half the school going through that courtyard and without needing an additional key because the courtyard is accessible from that far door. It's always accessible inward. You just can't necessarily get out. So we, we spent a lot of time figuring out where we would weigh the visibility of it to the accessibility of it. And that's where we thought it would be best served since we only have one right now accessible to us. Now, if in the future we wanted to put one on the other end of the building, we would need to do another evaluation um, weighing all of that out. But it was it was very, once we had it, we, we conferred with Dean, Dean said it makes sense once we realized we want it accessible not just to me, but to any law enforcement for whatever the needs are. And then to also shelter it but make it accessible to everybody. And I really have only had a couple of people talk to me. Um, the kids that have come in have actually, I've gotten overwhelmingly good responses from the kids that, hey, that's cool that that's there now. Um, I personally haven't heard anything negative about it. So I have had a few community members or kids or staff like say, hey, what's the plan with that? And most of them, once they realize that it's only law enforcement that has access to it, have felt better about the decision to put it there. Jamie, can you talk about the um, the key or the code in order to get in and how that's shared? So I actually haven't um, finished setting it up all the way yet because we haven't put any um, of the fingerprints in it. So currently it's housing nothing until every put and I knew there were questions. I didn't want to put a gun in it yet if it was going to need to mm -hmm. be moved. Um, so there's, there's currently nothing in it. Um, the key, I only, I have the key. I actually have both keys. So one's at the police department and, um, one is in a safe location and, <laughs> um, I have not set the code yet. So just because I wasn't sure if we were going to move it and I wanted other people to be able to access it if it needs to be moved without me being there. So currently any um, anybody's fingerprint will open it because that's the default for until you set it up. Once I set it up, I will have the code. Um, 
the law enforcement members will be given the code um, and we'll start inputting their biometric fingerprints as well. The chief and I were going to discuss whether or not we wanted everybody to have the full code um, or just use their fingerprints and just have our department with the code. Um, we haven't made a final decision on that. So that's actually, if you guys have a feeling one way or the other on that, um, you know, there's a saying in law enforcement that loose lips sink ships. So um, I can see both positives and negatives to having the actual code out there. Um, Does the safe accept multiple codes? Like if you have 10 officers, you can have 10 different codes. No, it's one code. It's only one code. Yep. Okay. So then you're communicating a change of code with several mm -hmm. people. Okay. So a couple of questions. Um, the other SROs that we have in the area. So Sering has an SRO, O'Connell has an SRO. Do they have safes with long guns and where are they located? So they have safes and long guns ordered. O'Connell has the safe. Okay. Um, they don't have they haven't purchased the long gun yet, is my understanding. They are putting, they have a brand new middle school and that's where Cassie's office is. Okay. So Captain Dufex, the safe is going in um, since it's a brand new middle school and um, it is pretty centrally located. The safe is going to stay in her office. Her office is static. So, um, you know, they're never gonna move the SRO office. Okay. And I would say in a new building, you can plan for that. Um, because you're never going to take the SRO office and make it into an educational room. Right. But right now at the high school, we don't have that capabilities currently. So um, it will be in her office. Suring has not put it in yet. Um, I know that Sheriff Scarden has said they are giving him one, um, that they will be putting it in the building. I don't know, though, what his setup is, so I can't really answer that as far as Suring goes. Um, but the plan is to put one in before the beginning of next year in Surrey as well. Okay. If if you had a permanent office, all the time SRO office, would you think that's a better location? Or I mean, you you talked about a lot of the benefits about doing this. Yeah. And I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, I think the drawback to having it in somebody's locked office is that you eliminate. Um, the availability of it to every other law enforcement. So other law enforcement doesn't have access to my, my office. They don't have a key to my room. So if we put it in an office and it's not a central location, then they will not have access to that at all if in the event of an emergency. Um, so we would really need to weigh the visibility of it to the accessibility of it because they're either, I mean, in the new building, the office isn't gonna be the oldest door. Like at the high school right now, it's probably one of the oldest doors in the entire high school. It's that old rickety, you know, at dances in the old gym, the door actually sounds like the glass is gonna break, it bounces mm -hmm. so bad. So in the new building, I would imagine it's gonna be a much more secure door. And uh, currently they could probably break into my office if they tried hard enough, but um, I don't know that that saves any time or that it makes it more accessible in the event of a true emergency where it's not you know, it's an after hours something or other. So um, I think we could we could quarterback it all day long and come up with a list of, but it's really a matter of whether we're gonna prioritize visibility over accountability. And that's just a decision that we have to make is whether or not we want it, um, I shouldn't, okay, accessibility and visibility, yeah. whether we want it accessible to all law enforcement or at the expense of some visibility or whether or not we wanna so Make it invisible. majority of law enforcement, if they're responding to an emergency, they're coming with their own long gun. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, they're so, not coming with additional mags. So they're getting out. And if if they, you know, sometimes one of them will grab an extra one. The hope is that you never need additional. Sure. Um, but they're, yeah, they're going to come with the right 20 to 30 rounds depending on what kind of gun they have um and but yes most people if they're responding in a vehicle they're going to have their own rifle with them if they're off duty in an event they're not going to have anything so you just they might not even have their hand uh, so you just answer my next question if there's an off-duty officer in the building they would have a yeah. proper access to that because Correct. they're not coming in yes I mean, and, was, and that really that depending, an interesting thing that you just said though is that oftentimes they might be at an event but they may not have a 
weapon on them at all. Correct. So that's where the accessibility really makes a difference. Correct. And way. for for the sake of arguments, if our if I'm out of town, right, or I'm not at the event and the on-duty officer is taking somebody to jail and there's an event but we have off duty in the building that have nothing, you're looking at a if we're lucky, a five minute response from somebody in the county. Five minutes is a long time in an active event where if somebody's in the building and they have access to it. I mean, we could, if we're keeping it law enforcement only, depending on what you want it to do, we have the extra accessibility. I mean, we have we have parents in our district who are routinely here who are Green Bay police officers, who are Brown County officers, who are um, you know, Marinette, who live in our community, but they don't work for us. If they're sworn law enforcement, we could theoretically provide them with access um, in, the, in that event as well with, I mean, all you would really need is a mutual aid agreement that in the event of an emergency that they would be able to, you know, access our stuff. So it really depends on who you wanna make it accessible to. I mean, I, I wouldn't hand it out to anybody who's not sworn in a sworn capacity currently serving, but I mean, we have a lot of capabilities with this. So some of the complaints that I received over the weekend were not necessarily about the safe itself, but about the communication part. Um, so do you think that if communication was a little bit better prior to that we would have the grief that we have had? I mean, I'm not privy to your conversation, so I think it definitely we could we could have done better, yes, at making sure that it, um, and certainly within our our staff for starters, sure. um, because you know then it then it kind of trickles. But um, yeah, we we could have done a better job communicating that to everybody. Was that a conscious decision to kind of? be quiet or, or do not communicate a lot on that or no it had sat in the office for over well over a month and it got put in i believe on friday morning so it, it was in um less than a week and um when we came back mr moore had said like uh, somebody mentioned it to him um and he's like hey we should put something out as soon as possible can you think of some verbiage that you were at that meeting for how it came about and how it was voted on that we can push out in an email? Um, and then that week kind of turned into a hot mess, for lack of better words. And a couple days went by and then people are questioning and we were like, oh shoot, we needed to. So I think it was actually Tuesday night because I was at, um, I sent it right before the, the young middle schoolers amazing jazz performance. So I had sent my um, suggestions to Mr. Moore and I think it was the next morning that he had it, he had it out. So it was kind of a, a group fail, I guess. I didn't get, he asked for my assistance. I didn't get it to him in a timely manner. And then the wheels fell off the wagon and everybody prioritized other things. Um, and in large part, because we didn't have a weapon in it yet. And that was part of the miscommunication also because I think some of the feedback that I got was that there was a gun in the safe and there, there were assumptions made at that yeah. point. Mm -hmm. So it was a good learning mm -hmm. process okay. for all of us. Brian, um, Brian and I were both at that uh, concert and that's when I had heard um, A, great music at the concert and uh, I had also heard just some concerns about the you know, the timeliness of getting put in there communicated. I went for a walk before the concert started and just walked down to take a look at the location. And um, I, I do agree that from a location standpoint, the central location plus access from the two doors, like if you were, would happen to be coming in, so you have two exterior doors along that 300 on both sides of the school, plus the main hallway. Um, and if you didn't actually know what it was and you're just walking by, it is pretty discreet, actually. I was kind of, I don't want to say pleasantly surprised, but it, it, I was expecting something bigger and maybe a little more noticeable. And so I walked up. I don't know if I talked to you about it. I don't know if you were able to see it on your on your way up. Well, I, I did. Same thing. I mean, it, to me, it's pretty discreet. And, you know, I appreciate you, you know, sharing the thought process behind it, because what you just shared now provides light as to why. 
Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, everyone can make assumptions and, you know, you know, they're going to have their opinions on, well, why was it done? But now hearing why it was done, it helps tie it together to make sense. And, you know, I went back to that board meeting back in December and I reviewed the, the tape, the video myself. And, you know, you said you take fault. Don't take fault in what was done. You know, please get that out of here, um, out of that. Um, because, you know, we did approve and we did, as a board, say we want to do this. But we didn't really tie the loop as to is it going to be in the office or is it not? So the motion was made, but nothing specifically was said about location. So there's a lot of finger pointing that could be done. So just don't think people are finger pointing at you. I just want to kind of, Thank you. yeah, there, you know, you had the approval to go forward. I think it was just a little loose end that wasn't tied up. I think my, my impression is that kind of like, like you said, Brian, what, what we, uh, what we did was approve uh, the fact that the goes in and, 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 and I guess my assumption and uh, the way I feel yet now is the board probably has no, no uh, need to decide where it's going to go. You know, mm -hmm. Jamie, Danny, and the people that are involved are in a position as she described to us tonight as to where where the uh, optimum place in the building to put it is. And so I think that they they did that to the best of their ability and, and very effectively. I, I also, and I think the board probably or most people agree with this, I, I really appreciate um, the comments in, in open session and I do understand, or sorry, in, in a citizen participation and I do understand the uncomfortable topic that this is, and the fact that you know, 34 years ago, this wasn't even wasn't even about a topic, and we weren't concerned about kids having a gun in their truck because they were hunting on the way to school. I was one of those kids, and um, you know, now we've progressed to where we're, we're doing this, but it's all in the interest of safety of. Our staff, our kids, you know, the community when they're in our, our buildings, um, and I appreciate you bringing it up as a proactive measure for something else to consider. Um, hopefully, the you know the the unease and uncomfortableness through communications will continue to help, and and eventually people will just forget that it's even there when you walk by. Um, and hopefully, we never ever ever even remotely have to use it for the purpose of why we're putting it in. Hopefully, they forget, but maybe they. Hopefully they don't forget. Yeah. So they know in, that. In some cases, <laughs> they know right. we're prepared. Yeah. yeah. Either, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I guess is there any other any other concerns by the board? That, you know, of, of wanting to take any sort of action. It it doesn't sound like it to you know for us to override the decision of location. I don't. I'm not getting that sense from anybody. I guess. No. Um, well, one thing we have here on the agenda says option to other buildings. Yeah. Um, I mean, I thought the motion was fairly clear back in December that you had that latitude to move forward with the other buildings. So my expectation is that we're gonna still look at Abrams and Office Elementary and the new Washington to make sure that those buildings have the same uh, secure resources as what we just did here. If, if the need is there, I mean, if you have a professional opinion right. is that it, then it's needed. Do you guys think that Jamie can uh, take any staff member and show them how sensitive that safe is? So if somebody does hit it, how it goes off. So maybe that would make them more comfortable. Yeah, if somebody wanted to, we could. I think that we should send an email out and then set a date. So you're not doing it over and over and over. I mean, we could record it too and put it out through staff email. email. That'd be a good idea too. Better if anyone has concerns and they want to proactively reach out to you and just set aside some time. I think knowledge yeah. is knowledge usually adds a little bit of comfort. So, you know, visiting with you and seeing it and whether or not you sound off the alarm but explain what it does and all that you know for those that that are so interested that might be, mm -hmm. might be a good idea and i think we are giving jamie latitude also so if it does come that she does think that we should move it then we move it yeah, right you know right. i mean i think put it, put it where you 
Right. That feel mm -hmm. it's best serves yeah. its purpose. It's one of the things I guess I'd like the board to, to consider right now to give guidance. We didn't have this information when we first talked about it, but um, I know at one point we had talked about access through a fingerprint and you brought up this evening, it's, it has latitude whether or not you want to go further than that. Um, I will point out I have a little anxiety about going that next step with a code because anytime you have a code, um, having been in the military, you have people leave your organization and, and people come into your organization. And it's kind of like the concept that we've gone to now. We used to have keys. Well, you lose keys or you try to get keys back from people and you don't recover them. Now, if you lose one of these, you can just make it not work anymore. And so I guess I pitch that out there for the board to think about right now. I don't know if you have a recommendation or not, but before we walk away this evening, it'd be nice to, to have that conversation. Well, you make a great point, and I was actually thinking about that. Just my next statement is I would personally like to keep it to the biometric of the individual. Um, code 1234 can easily get shared somehow, some way, and it's going to social media, phones, and everything else like this. Next thing you know, someone's going to have the code that should not have it. Um, so if we can keep it to law enforcement, um, just, just biometric only, I, I think that's a good starting point. Can we make a motion on that? So it, it's just that you certainly can. I like to make a motion is just by fingerprint. Can I ask for clarification? Do you want my whole department to only have biometric? Like you want the SRO to be the only one with the code? Or are we limiting, like can, does O'Connell Falls PD have the code? And it's anyone outside of our jurisdiction that has the biometric? Or are we saying code is SRO only and maybe the chief? So in the event- I think- I crash on the way to Green Bay that the chief can reset things um i think you should have at least two people just because if something you never i mean i could can i go one step for uh further and say you chief and sheriff yeah mm -hmm. i mean we can we can do it however i would just recommend that at least two people have a code um if you're gonna limit it to, or if you're gonna exclude other officers as well that there's somebody else who could come in in the event of a well, when I brought this up, I didn't mean to exclude officers. My intent, though, would be you had mentioned that you can give other law enforcement a biometric access as well. Yes, yes. yes. So I guess what I was thinking, and I'm going to be quiet because it's you, the board, but a lot of what Jamie spoke with you about tonight was accessibility by an off-duty police officer who has to be watching the basketball game. Now, maybe you start out with a sphere of influence and then you can expand it later on, but uh, I would think it would, you'd want more than just those three people. Otherwise, to some extent, you're limiting yourself. Well, they would have biometric capability. Yeah, they just wouldn't three have, people the have the code. Right. right. So more would have the that's how I Only would three understand. would have the code. Right. And then any law enforcement officer within the county, county and or well, with Jamie's discretion. Yes. That's biometric. Mm -hmm. I don't want to cheat. The, the biometric, is that housed in a database? How is that? So if like, if someone was no longer on, um, no longer a law enforcement officer, could you take their biometrics out of it? Yes. And is that like? It's housed internally. So there's a potential, it, it says you can take it out. Now I'd have to punch in like number 20. Okay, you no know, fingerprint because it, it would be record keeping on my end on who's the biometric print. Um, worst comes to worst, you reset it and just make sure that everybody stops in within the next week or two to to put in a new print. If you had to, uh, you can you can reset it as often as you want. You can zero the whole system out and start over if you have to. But it it does it does say that you can keep track of it and then remove an individual as needed. So Chad, are you, your motion, are you comfortable with the bio, if I'm 
hearing what you said and now a little bit of discussion here is your motion for biometric for you know any officers that the sro deems can be on the system and then the code itself is only known by the sro the the police chief in town and the county sheriff yes okay Motion by Chad. Do we have a second by anybody on that? So before we second it, are we? Are, there's discussion after the second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll second. Second by Brian. Um. Open for discussion. Oh no, yes, sir. So, um, providing the biometric to. So I just want to clarify, and maybe throw concern um so you know let's say you like you said you know there's police officer in green bay marinette what have you that um were given the 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 biometric ability to to get in um i don't know how i feel about that i don't know i just like kind of like what you said like it's nice to have a lot of people available to, to be able to do that but also the more people you have but that's more people to like keep track of so you know maybe so and so has a job in green bay today they have their biometric in there and then all of a sudden something happens and they're not on you know employed anymore you know yeah. I, i'm just trying to like think so through different it, situations. would i say that i envision that there would be a process to that they would submit a request their chief would need to approve that request so they're aware that they may act off duty um, in the event of something like that. And then they would also, in doing so, would, would in return notify us if they're not in good standing. So I wouldn't recommend that we give anybody access to it um, without their department's head signing off, stating that they're in good standing with the department and that they, uh, you know, are okay with them doing so. So that's really no different than if I want a part-time job, the the city or the chief of police has to approve that I'm going to do something outside of what I'm doing, right? So um, and while this may not be a job, I think I, I can see your concern because you're widening that net in terms of keeping track of who it is. Um, I, I don't think that if we're keeping track of our own department, that it's really that much bigger. I don't think there's going to be that many people that want access, number one, or want that responsibility. But also, um, you know, if I have 34 people on my list and three other people get on there, I don't think it's that much of an issue, I guess, in terms of, of organization or record keeping for it, because I'm going to have to keep track of the record anyway. Um, right. I mean, I think it would, and I'm fine with either way. If you don't want them to, don't don't do it. Right. If you do, I mean, I would think that the person coming forward, it would have to make sense. Like, okay, you know, they have a kid in the district and they spend a lot of time in the school, mm -hmm. so that would make sense. But we wouldn't say, hey, you know, you live in town and you might be around. Right. Like, if they would have to. You have can still vet them. You can right. still have a vetting right. process. Yeah. 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 And that's a, and that's a matter of setting a standard procedure right. for us to follow when we're doing. You're not going to rubber stamp anyone who says, "Hey, I want the nope. biometric." Correct. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. We have the motion again for biometric for law enforcement, uh, and then the code uh, allowed to be given or allowed to be uh, known by the SRO, the city police chief, and then the county sheriff. One more uh, topic here. <laughs> um, um, so does does there need to, so you said there needs to be like procedure so when I hear procedure I think of policy so like does there need to be policy written for how this goes about how these people get chosen what happens when they I, I think there needs to be some specific language somewhere in a policy that says how we go about doing this normally your policy is probably not going to be that specific um, your policy would be more aligned with saying that you've you've taken the action to install something like this for the following reason. 
Um, it doesn't mean that you can't come up with a procedure. And actually, I, I appreciate that you bringing that up because I would anticipate that this would be a collaboration between you and I and other members of the administrative team. Um, I wouldn't leave that strictly to one person to make the decision on that list. Um, we could work on something like that and then bring it back to the board. Is this something that the chair of the safety committee or the safety committee should be a part of? It's up to you. Yeah, it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I would, I would appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that committee should be involved with anything going forward if we do choose to install another other schools that they just be kept abreast of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think those comments can be noted and just taken into how you put that together. I don't think that needs a board action on that other than it is kind of our expectation that those does get looked at. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Any other? So just so I will not move forward with anybody outside of local law enforcement, including the counties in that. Um, until we have a consensus between uh, Dr. Hess, the safety committee, and the admins as to what we're going to do outside of the locals. The locals Lo meaning local city, city, and city, and county. City, and county. city and county. Okay. okay. So just to be clear, the motion is to have biometrics oh. for a local and county number codes for you, city chief, county chief, county, the sheriff. Yes. Um, I'm missing, is that it? Is that, well, that's the motion? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. All right. New business. Uh, 2324 early release schedule. Good evening. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to share with you um, some information about reviewing how we use early release this past year. Um, talk a little bit about the value of that time to share with your proposal for this next calendar year. So just an overview of the plan for early release. Um, the purpose behind our early release monthly <coughs> time was created in response to student needs. That's how early release came about. The goal that we established was to effectively collaborate as educators so we could close uh, achievement gaps for students and to improve teaching and learning for all of our students, not just students who are struggling. So we prioritize some specific activities for early release time. First of all, the focus is on individual student needs. And so with that focus, we're taking a look at data. Um, we are collaborating and we're planning in response to individual student needs. And we're also taking some time for that parent and family communication specific to the needs of our students. Um, and then we're also thinking about overall instructional improvement. And so some of those same activities that we do in response to individual student needs are also applicable when we're thinking about overall instructional improvement. So that includes data analysis, collaboration and planning, and it also includes professional development. So this time is incredibly valuable and it is unique. Um, this time provides regular structured time within our schedule for staff to have access to one of our most valuable resources, which is each other. If you think about our daily schedule within our buildings, um, staff members do have time to get together with some other members of the staff. Um, however, they don't have opportunities to get together with everyone that they could potentially need to work with in order to improve teaching and learning for all of our students. So you might have um, grade level teachers who can meet, but maybe their schedules are different that are more difficult for working with um, the teachers across the district who are at the other elementary school. So early release time gives them the opportunity for them to come together. 
Um, like our students, teachers do have unique learning needs too. So teachers continue to learn and grow. Um, and early release time provides us with time for differentiated professional development for our teachers as well. So we can meet unique teaching learning needs. Um, this is time that provides additional opportunities for struggling students um, to work with their teachers at the high school in particular. Um, they have used this time to work with struggling students, provides a longer block of time for teachers to work with those students. Early release time also helps to address concerns from the spring 2022 staff survey. As you know from those staff survey results that our teachers workload um, and the stresses of teaching continue to grow and early release time provides some really important opportunities for them to address some of those that workload and those needs that otherwise is not built into their schedule and they would have to do that on their time outside of their scheduled school day. And also this time provides a timely response to pressing student and staff needs by building. With our current structure where we are meeting on the first and third Wednesday of every month, that's regular and timely meeting so that we can take a look at data, discuss what the needs are, and respond in a timely manner, not that the meetings are so infrequent. And so there's a need that arises, but it takes a while before there's time for people to get together, and then more time to implement our response to that need. So when we share this information and think about um, all of the ways that early release time is incredibly valuable and incredibly important, we also know that when we have early release time, that this puts some stress and strain on our families. We're recognizing that this is a big ask of our community to support early release time. And we recognize that and we would only ask for this time if we believe that it's truly necessary. Now, we know, like I was here presenting data earlier this school year, we're not where we want to be yet when it comes to teaching and learning in the district. And when you think about change and how change happens, change happens often in small increments, right? There's not one sweeping event, sometimes it's that way, but more often it happens as a result of small steps that we take to move in a particular direction. Um, if you don't just get up off the couch and run a marathon the next day, there's a lot of work that goes into preparing and small changes that are made to be able to run a marathon. And in a similar way, early release provides us time regularly to put together, to take those actions and to take those steps to continue to move forward to meet our teaching and learning needs in the district. So growth for all with support from all. The growth that we want only truly happens when we have support from everyone. And in this sense, it's also support from our families and our, from our community, because we understand we're asking a lot of them to have the early release time and it impacts family schedules. Um, but we truly believe that this time is necessary for us to move forward in the way that we would like. So as an administrative team, we took a look at a couple of options. Actually, we looked, talked about all the options again, <laughs> um, all of the different ways that we could have release time in order to build into the schedule, um, in order to um, still meet our teaching and learning goals, our early release goals, um, and to also be thinking of the pros and cons for all of these different options. And so what I'm sharing with you are two options that we feel are um, options which have the most pros and the fewest cons when we are thinking about what our goals are with early release. So option number one is to keep early release days as is, which is the first and third Wednesday of each month. Um, the pros for that is that they allow for timely response to student needs. It provides a consistent schedule, so that is easier to plan for. Um, it's a productive work day. So when we look at other days of the week when you could do an early release, we've talked about that before, that um, while it might be better for families to do a Friday, Friday afternoon is not the productive time for the staff to do this really important work. 
Um, students are in school for more than half of the day when we do an early release. So they're getting that teacher contact time um, and they have that opportunity to have uh, learning happen on those release days. And with that um, release on Wednesday it causes the least conflict when we think about sports and activities for scheduling. Now the cons, it's the same con that would be with any kind of release, um, which is that there's childcare challenges for families. And another con is that shortened class periods can lead to less productive learning. It's not the same um, to have a shorter class period, and so it's not as productive learning time. The second option is to move to full days once per month and co-locate PD days with early release by adding a full day into the calendar um, to September, November, February, and April. Um, December was not included in that. It's already a month where we have a lot of days that we are not in school. Now, the pro for that option is that families are only impacted once per month rather than twice. Um, another pro for that is it provides more flexibility for staff to collaborate with different people or groups. So um, they have, because it's a longer amount of time, um, there's more time for travel, for getting together with, um, for example, a content area group in the morning and a uh, grade level group in the afternoon. Um, the cons for this option is that it's more challenging for timely responses to student needs. So without, you have an entire month, or in the case when we go from November to January, a couple of months go by without having that time together. So um, there's less opportunity then to respond in a timely manner to our student needs. Another con is that students are out for the entire day. So they don't see their teachers at all. Um, for our students that currently are getting assistance and support during early release, they're less likely to come in if it's a full day of um, PD and early release to get in, come in to get that extra support and that help. Um, and there's a full day child care challenge with option two. So for some families, uh, it would be more <coughs> difficult to cover a full day. For other families, it would be less difficult because it is a full day. So our recommendation moving forward is that recognizing the value of this time and considering the pros and cons of all of the options, we recommend that the Board of Education add early release time on the first and first third Wednesdays of each month to the 2023-2024 calendar. What questions do you have? Um, Can we go back to the options slide real quick? Yes. So option one, that's giving you approximately four hours per month? Correct. Correct. So option two is then giving you almost double that? Uh, seven right. hours. Seven and a half Seven and a half hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, what I would like to bring up or discuss is I remember this conversation from last year when you presented mm -hmm. it. So thank you again for presenting it again. Um, the thing that kind of sticks with me right now is on option two, I know you have a list of cons, but in my mind right now, those are assumptions to me because we haven't tested against option one. Um, I'm not disagreeing with giving the teachers the opportunity to have some extra time, um, but I would like a measuring stick. So, I mean, I, I personally would like option two because you need to measure something against something. Um, option one, we've done it two years in a row, and I know you're proposing to go for the third year now. Um, maybe there's some things embedded in there that we just don't know about because we haven't tried it. And um, I guess I just wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. the option two again. So um, support staff, are we, is that a working day for them too? How are we including them in that day? It depends on the support staff. So you have some support staff members that their primary role is not directly with kids. Um, you have some support staff members, their role is 100% with kids. So if the kids are not there, um, they may or may not be involved. And how do we know if the kids are going to be there or not? So that's the other thing too, is are they in that option are they signing up early and then 
with the expectation that they're going to be there and then we would so this is a perfect example what you just brought up is an example of and i'll i'll kind of go with what you're bringing up and what brian's bringing up at the same time um another admin jump in if if you feel the need so we just had an opportunity to talk about the the gun safe with our school resource officer and she was pretty eloquent in sharing you know all the things that went into the placement of that and i think it very quickly people recognized that it made sense similarly in this situation you have professional educators who work with kids on a daily basis and they're putting forward this proposal because in their mind um, they recognize through their experience it, it's more realistic that i can bring someone along with learning something if i give them shorter small amounts more often than if i try to give them larger amounts less often um, i understand the measuring stick concept but i also want to make sure i'm honoring the experience of some of the people that have put their effort into this um, we recognize that and it was interesting to listen to our student presenters tonight when they said and sometimes we made mistakes and I thought to them, bless your heart that you brought that up because we all do every day. We work with young people and young people are not machines. They're, they're very, very complicated and they learn in different ways. So we put forth the experience that we have to try to help them learn something and quite often they don't. And so then we have to come up with a different way and with some people, many, many times to get them to understand the concepts. So it's interesting that this week is Teacher Appreciation Week um, because this is one of the things that I will share with you. Your decision has had a very positive impact on staff and they really appreciated your support because someone once told me that the definition of stress is a perceived inability to meet a demand that's being placed upon you. And, and that really, in a lot of ways, describes people in education on a daily basis because they're working with something they don't control and yet they feel a responsibility for the outcome. So I bring up to you that we absolutely understand the, the, the impact um, the strain that this puts on families. And if you decide that you want to do option two, we will respect that and we'll do the best we can to move forward. But quite honestly, you know, when I, when I look at this, um, Heather, you brought up that we are not where we want to be. We're not. When we look at the number of students that are proficient right now in literacy and math, because that's, that's where we turn to immediately because that's where we get measured. But it's a lot more than that. Uh, I put out a communication last night to our team. There's a lot of positive impacts that are happening every day that aren't measured by a standardized test. With that in mind, those people are putting themselves out there way beyond what most people know. Um, perfect example tonight is the band teacher, you know, sharing all the positive things, some of which I didn't know. And that communication is huge. So, I, I think we can, we'll work with whatever it is that, that you, the board, you know, decide to move forward with. Um, but in all honesty, I would ask to be thoughtful to try to stay the course because this is going to be an ongoing process. We are, we are really needing to continue to focus on the learning outcomes of our students. And I'll put a plug in right now. It's, it's not just the educators and the support staff and the folks here in the school district, but we need the help of, of everybody. Um, for you mom and dads out there who are investing yourselves with your children each night to ask them about what they learned and to sit down and read with them and to practice with their homework, that is wildly appreciated because, you know, when they talk about it takes a village, like no, no truer statement was, was ever made. So, um, yeah, we can, we can make option two or even three or four or whatever option we come up with. We'll do the best that we can, 
But I guess I just wanted to take a minute and pitch out there that there was a reason why the, the option one was created. And quite honestly, it really focused on the kids' needs, not so much the <clears throat> needs of the family. I mean, I'm, on, I'm, I'm honest in that. We, we right now are focused on the kids. Steph? Um, I just, just because we said that we could chime in. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, we actually do, we do test the other, the full day thing out because we have the full, we have four full PD days. Mm -hmm. So like from what we do and, and Heather and any of you guys could probably like piggyback off of that is they're so different. In, in what we do on a full PD day versus today's an early release day, just the work, you maybe could talk a little bit more about that, but the type of work we do is just really different because you're able to do like short bursts, kind of what Dean is talking about, and then follow up quickly with it, which is for a lot of things more effective. Well, and, and coming back to what Carrie asked, if I want to try to bring kids in on a full day of PD, I mean, I can request it, but the chance of getting those kids, the support system isn't there. Versus once we have them there, the chance of getting them to stick around and we just need to try to get them away home, it's a lot more realistic. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that the roadblocks that I have heard from families is the daycare situation and having to flex their schedule. So. Are there ways for us to look at option one, but providing some kind of care for those kids that cannot be be picked up or, or brought home for those two hours that they would normally have their, their normal schedule? We've, we've looked at that and discussed it. The issues that we run into though is now we're taking people away from what we're trying to do with them and what they're trying to do with kids to go over here and supervise kids. Right, um, but, but we have, but you're telling me in option two, we would have some individuals that wouldn't be called to work so they're, because they're not working with students at that point. So wouldn't they be without a couple hours of work if in option one also? No, they stay in option one. It depends. I mean, to answer your question, could you potentially try and come up with something? You, you could, I mean, right now, you can go into what they're doing now. We'd have to redirect them in option one. Well, I think that would probably only be a, a true issue at the elementary schools. I don't know if that would even be a situation that you would have to deal with at the middle school. I mean, referring to the that. staff members. Right, the, the staff members caring for kids. I don't know if that the the age level of if they would if they need. I mean, every situation is different. So, so an example of what I'm thinking of is um, during professional development days, like the full days, paraprofessionals do not come in on those days. Right, but they do stay during early release time. So right. that's like another kind of difference of like the work that we do. They stay during that time because right. So yeah. would they be available for another direction, like? supervising the kids that can't be accommodated is what my thought is. The other thought is, and the other, so what I ran into this year is having a freshman um, with the early release <coughs> is that he had practice at 315. So from the time that he got out to the time he had to report for practice, there's a couple hours there. And, you know, in the dead of winter, he's not just taking a jaunt to Subway. So, and he couldn't necessarily stay here because if you had a big group of kids and it didn't work out well, and that's not what the, the building wanted at that point. So, I mean, there are, there are some issues that come up with, with that age group too. And I think that the middle school would probably have that same situation. So. And not, not to try to invent too much, but have we, we, we do early release and we thought about early or late late start instead. Well, one thing I want to throw out there, just part of the thought process is, why are we sending bus drivers out in the morning to go pick them up a few hours later when we could save sending buses out two days? I mean, isn't there a little bit of cost behind that as well? You know, we have a stretch on bus drivers and there's an opportunity to save days of sending buses out. 
Nothing just good. just throwing it out there. Have we done any staff surveys? And what staff wants at this point, or are we just taking the feedback from what they're they're telling you, but not? Yeah, so we have not done an official staff survey, and so it's okay. all anecdotal feedback okay. that we've gotten. Where would you put the strength of, I guess, the day? and obviously you wanted to come and have an option or two, but I'm sensing, I'm trying to understand whether the second option was to simply put an option up there or was it, hey, these are both viable and we're kind of leaning towards the one that we're doing right now, or is there a very strong opinion of one or the other? So from my perspective, Option one has strong support. We we have, option two is there because we felt that was the next best option if we wanted to move to a different structure or time for our release time. I've been in the uh, in the building, the high school building, on early release days in the afternoon and after it starts. For you know usually in the ag uh, department, but also having conversations with other teachers. And one of the things that, that has impressed me is uh, is how flexible uh, that time can be. Uh, those teachers one day will, you know, and will have a kid or kids in there that need some uh, direction. Or in, in the case of the high school that, that, that have other uh, projects or, or things they're working on. Other times they're collaborating with each other, uh, sometimes within their own groups and sometimes across disciplines. So I think, uh, and uh, as as uh, as has been pointed out, I think when you had, if we were to add full uh, PD days, I I don't know that 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 would uh, that that would happen. I'm a long ways away from having to worry about childcare challenges uh, personally, <laughs> but uh, and so I can understand that, but it. Uh, you know, there's as it points out here, the, the con. There's ch there's challenges both ways. Uh, or I mean, with both of these options, as far as childcare, um, a, a thought, a couple of thoughts that I had when I served on the Nicolay Library Board, I was aware of a, a couple of uh, uh, libraries and communities that uh, program specifically for early release days, and uh, so that the kids that had an option, I guess, or parents had an option for their kids uh, to go for the for those couple of hours after uh, after they were released to, uh, to go. And I'm wondering if if uh, with the uh, uh, Encompass coming to town, if uh, something for the younger kids that that might need it, if something could be uh, worked with that group to take care of uh, or to partially at least release the child care challenges. But it seems to me, with uh, with the arguments that that Heather's made, uh, I think that from the standpoint of the effectiveness and trying to accomplish what we what we wanted to accomplish with uh, these early release days uh, option, one it seems to me just would be far uh, far and above more uh, more of what we a program that would better meet our meet our needs or allow us to meet our needs and and what we want to accomplish. So I have one question. So on them half days, kids can stay to make up work, correct? On yep. them half days? Yeah. On the early yes. release days? Yes. 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 All right. Actually, I think it's 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 different at different buildings. So right now I know at the high school that is the case. I don't know if that's the case in the other three buildings. No. Okay, so I'm going to have to do it. So my kid was missing assignments. He was behind on one test, and he asked to stay to make it up, and his teacher said no. And I know that you said that you have the kids there to – make up work and you don't have to try to get them there when you don't have school but you have them there but the kid gets 
turned down. So I don't understand that the kid wants to make work up and the teacher says no. So what so what good is that? You know, so then you might as well go with option two. If the so teacher doesn't want to stay. Without um, having an opportunity to talk to the teacher to get a better understanding of the situation, uh, there could be a variety of reasons why the teacher said no. Um, my assumption would be that there was something else. There's a meeting perhaps that the teacher was scheduled to be a part of or a specific collaboration. So while supporting students who um, are struggling is one of the things that we do during early release time, it's not the only thing. And so there are times when there is more of a focus on one of those other areas for early release time and it's not just students supporting students who um, who are missing work or who are struggling students are also able to stay in the LMC you know so if a particular teacher maybe is tied up with meetings in the afternoon and it can't be working with that student a student could stay after and and work you know at, in the building so that that is an option. All of the teachers understand that. That was built in. We appreciated the when we made that change when the board gave that upset ability to have students stay last year. And um, all the teachers know that. Although it may not work out for a particular teacher on a given day, but mm -hmm. students still have the option. Dan, uh, you've been in education for a long time in a lot of different different buildings, elementary and high school, et cetera. And, in other schools and you're uh finishing your your tenure here i mean what what's your take on the early release in the last couple of years and uh pros cons maybe not i mean just the how much are we impacting i understand we're impacting families i, I get that i'm one of the families that's gotten impacted of what do we do with the kids on those days but I, i'm just curious your perspective on the effectiveness of of the days i think they're highly effective and i think it's very i mean that two hour block of time and if you look at that priority list that we created i mean i think it's right on i i revisit that every two weeks with staff just as a reminder number one individual student planning meetings and we have that frequently so that if a student's struggling <coughs> you can have some conversation, you can develop some plans, and you can make those parent phone calls and send those parent emails out. Um, it's just really hard. The day of a teacher is extremely busy, and those 44 minutes of times that they have go really quickly. And so to have finally a, a chance every two weeks to have the meetings, to do the planning, to make the parent calls, it's, it's important. Um, so I, I think it's valuable. I think, I think to do it every two weeks makes a lot of sense too. Um, I do understand the point about trying to do some, have some kind of support for the elementary families in particular. Mm -hmm. And if there would be a way to be able to, to help with that child care piece, that would be great. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's a good investment in our, in our teaching staff which then passes along to the students and families. How, how detrimental, not detrimental, but I mean, how much would we give up by only doing it once a, once a month instead of twice a month? To go to the two hours? Yeah. Just once a month. Um, so what you're losing then is that uh, that timely response to like reviewing data, having those, having opportunity to have those meetings, put a plan in place because you're stretching out how much time there is between each of those early release days. And so that's one of the, that's what immediately comes to mind when I think about um, a barrier or an obstacle that would happen as a result of moving to that. And then I think that also would put some out of stress on our teachers because I think then they would try to jam in to that early release as much as what they would have done in two early releases into just that one um, so that they could because 
you know, our teachers put our kids first. And so they're always thinking about how they are best serving their, their students. Um, and so it is really hard to think about, oh, but if I don't get to this, and if you don't have a chance to meet and talk about this student, then we're not going to be able to put these strategies in place to work with this student. And it'll be a month of these, you know, before we can actually, maybe it's that we're trying to arrange a meeting after school and we can't get everybody together. So um, while some time is better than no time, I will say that I would say that it would have a you're going to be cutting it in half, and it would have a big effect on the effectiveness of the time. Why present two options? Then? No, it was the question was about going to a um, really going to early release just being once per month. So you would still have an option two. We have this large chunk of time. Um, we're still able to have those different meetings and those different collaborations. But that was one of the cons that uh, was listed with the timely response would not be there with moving to option two. I think to answer, to answer your question, why, why present a second option? Quite honestly, we're trying to honor the concerns that were brought forward. So we recognize that that we operate at the discretion of you, the board. So if if you, the board, felt you couldn't support option one, we'd rather have you support option two than to go away from it altogether. Mm -hmm. So. Is there, I've been hearing a lot of like uh, qualitative reasons why, is, is there any way to kind of have quantitative data to show, like to measure the success of this? So maybe not, this year, but next year, putting in goals to say, you know, these are the different um, success criteria that we're trying to make. And then you can come back to the board and say, these are the things that we were successful on because this we've implemented this on now year three, if we decide to go that way. Is there a way to do that? Yes, absolutely. So our pre, so this is the peered down version of the early release presentation. Um, I'm here all by myself the past two we had uh, administrators, more importantly, staff members who came, mm -hmm. and that was part of what they shared. So sure. they shared not just how they were using the time, but each school also addressed the data that supported the impact of early release. So for this presentation, this is the pared down version. I can absolutely bring back data um, <laughs> in the future to help you to, to show in the different ways that this time impacts our students. You bring up a good point because any decision that we make today doesn't have to be for the entire year or can we say this is going to be for x amount of months and then we'd like to see the data and then make a decision from there well i think we didn't make this decision until june last year this this was on the june agenda i don't know why i remember that but we're trying to be thoughtful of the families because the later that we make the decision, I think the year before that, we didn't get the decision made until like August. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very hard on families because literally they had to do about a three week, four week turnaround to get their plans together for child care. So, well, I just wonder, you know, I remember last year the data was, there was a lot, there was a lot of data. Um, so I, I wonder if there, if, you know, there could be just some super abbreviated key points maybe pulled out, you know, last year, this year, and then maybe within this time, like within the next month before our next meeting to just kind of thinking out of the box, how we can provide some sort of like supervision or child care, maybe survey support staff, maybe who would be willing to stick around for the, the hour, the two hours, two and a half hours between early release and the release time to do like a modified kid station. Right. Um, maybe not, you know, obviously there a lot of details would have to be sorted out, but maybe there are support staff who would love to stick around for two hours after, you know, to, to provide game night or movie night or we have kids that are in mentorships that are going into education we have groups that want to do um school dances to earn money to mm -hmm. for their groups you know so i mean there's there's opportunities so, that, looking for public service yes yep absolutely yeah and, so, it, and that could be at any that could be at any grade level i mean obviously the elementary school is the highest need but you know perhaps 
you know, there would be people willing to stick around at the middle school or high school level as well. So just, I don't know, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of it, but I'm, I, I will also want to be cognizant of the people who, who, you know, this affects the most, which is parents with young kids or maybe parents with kids who have special needs that can't, um, you know, go home on their own and spend a couple hours at home alone. Um, so I just, I want, I really want to be supportive of it, but I think I just, I would really love to hear some more maybe ideas in collaboration on how we can get kids supervised that can't, that don't have the option to go home or who, parents who really, really struggle with flexing or taking off that time. Do we get, Brian, if I understand, and you've talked about this topic in the past, is your biggest concern the just the the child care time and challenge on that? No, uh, that's that's part of it. I, you know, before I even answer that, I mean, what is the origin of early release? Did it come up during COVID? COVID. Yeah, it was no, no. So I, I just to clear the air with that, I, I just I just want to understand so everyone in the room yeah. has the same understanding when early release came about. Probably twenty plus years ago. Or um, how about to no. our district? Okay. Yes. So here's the thing that I guess I want to pitch out there. Um, we we went to Dan before because he's the senior member of our of our team. And if I were to ask Dan about the number of uh, initiatives that we are trying to juggle, and when I say we, I mean everyone in education today versus ten years ago versus twenty years ago. Um, I would I would hazard to bet that you would probably tell me this is probably the most difficult time in your career. Yes. Mm -hmm. So early release started from my perspective 20 plus years ago as we started to become more accountable to the end product of student learning. There's a huge difference between teaching and student learning. So 30 years ago, people were teaching. They taught every day and they graded papers and they gave feedback and they went home. Things started to change 20 years ago with accountability where we said, it's not good enough for you to be a great teacher. Now I'm gonna measure you by the number of students in your class that are proficient. We started putting benchmarks in there and we started to treat education a lot more like manufacturing. If you've never read the blue, blueberry story, I, I suggest you do so because the blueberry story talks about the fact that we don't get to do quality control on the raw product that walks through our doors. We get every blueberry that comes through the doors and we do everything we can to help them learn. So the stress on the system, and just so people have a little bit of understanding, I used to do quality control in a paper mill. And my job was to look at recycled paper to decide whether or not we were gonna put it in the hopper. And quite a bit of it, we didn't, we sent it back out. And we said, we're not buying that bale because it's got way too much stickies in it. It's got way too much print in it. We're never gonna be able to use enough whiteners and brighteners to get what we need. We don't get to do that with the kids. So my point is time becomes less and less and becomes a much more critical resource for the people involved in the system. So there's a lot of school districts that try to implement either an early release or a late start as part of their work to professionally develop their staff in order to interact with the kids who are struggling because there wasn't enough time in the system to get the job done. We didn't do that here and it wasn't because there wasn't a need, but quite honestly, and, and I'll take responsibility for it, I didn't think that there'd be enough support. We didn't have as much of a choice when COVID came around, the, the drastic needs were exacerbated. And so we brought this forward, but I will throw out to the group. We can, we can keep, we could actually do away with this and I'm not promoting this. Okay. But you could, as a board say, you know what, we're not doing this anymore. We can go back to what we did before we had this as an option, but I know that there's a serious concern right now related to the culture within our organization. And it's not just us in O'Connell Falls, it's in the profession. 
Well, the, one of the things that helps culture is when people feel like they're valued. One of the ways they feel valued is when we give them the tools that they need. I feel that you, the board, has given the members of the team some of the tools. Quite honestly, it's still, it's, I'm not sure that you ever get to the point where it's enough, but it's, it's an improvement in their ability to meet that demand. Um, the, the question becomes is, I think what, what I see people right now trying to figure out is, is it worth, is it worth the squeeze? You know, it's, it's a squeeze in our family and, and I get that. And, and I, don't, I don't know that there's an easy answer. It's a difficult situation. Um, but I will tell you that the needs of our students seem to keep growing. They don't, they don't seem to be getting less. And right now, your in, in individual conversations I've had with members of the board, you've shared with me, you would really like to see the proficiency levels going up. Um, and I, and I get that we're with you. I, I just, I worry sometimes because we're, we're trying to think about the culture of our organization and the needs of our kids. And yet we, we struggle with the resources and time is one. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with everyone in the room and everyone that's listening. I just would like to see a stab at option two for one year and then pull your teachers and pull the support staff and say, which one worked better? I, that's just, that's where I'm stuck. I'm just being honest and transparent with everyone in this room. I'm not saying I don't want to give these teachers the opportunity to have more time to teach our kids. So I don't want anyone to walk out of this room saying, hey, Ballmer was being, you know, he was so, oh. no, that's not what Ballmer is being right now. Ballmer likes to see options and say, Okay, we've done two things. Now tell me which one they like better. Brian, it, from the feedback that you've, I, I'm assuming you've gotten feedback from parents, do you feel like, I mean, maybe this would be a huge assumption on your part, unless you've heard differently. Do you think it would be easier for them to do a full day off? I, I, a lot of the feedback that I get, they say it would be easier on their calendars and their schedules to know what full day they had off ahead of time so they can plan their child care and plan their days with it being one full day versus having to do two individual days within a month. That's a big part of it. Hey, I can call grandma and grandpa up for one day a month and problem solved there. Yeah. I can, I do totally appreciate that, but I do, I do worry about the support staff and what they have to do for making up their time with option two. So uh, I just don't know that we're set up. I don't want to have an impact on a wallet either by by making a decision. I, I don't particularly like giving up. I mean, what are we talking? <coughs> eight or nine full days is what that would mm -hmm. is what that would be. With adding those four, with the four that exist, would be eight full days. Before currently in the calendar, okay. we'd be adding four days. So you're only adding only you're adding adding four. Correct. So what she's saying is you have four professional development days that are currently in the calendar mm -hmm. around these. And then if these would go to four full days, then we'd end up with the eight. When you when you put it like that in in my bright in my head, what just popped up is like what you're you're adding four four days sporadically throughout how in my mind like that how that doesn't help the kids who are struggling that doesn't that's not that doesn't do the job that we're trying to do with the time that we're given that's the thought i that's the thought i had too is that if we were to go to with option two we are basically eliminating one of the primary reasons for getting into this at all which is to help um, those students that need the help in a time because they're not, you know, they're not going to come in or not, they're not going to be brought in. We did go to, it did have something to do with COVID yeah. that we went to yeah. every other Wednesday. And that was because we had kids falling behind. Are we still, so now we're yeah. saying that this time is better used for professional development versus no, our no, priorities no, are still, still kids first yeah, I, and then yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think what happened was 
we were in we were in COVID. We we're coming up with a way, coming out of COVID, and saying how do we close these achievement gaps that have clearly happened as a result of COVID and kids not being in the classroom, and how do we improve that? Through doing this, the the staff has learned, hey, this is pretty effective. I'm able to get a get in touch with parents. I'm able to talk to other teachers about student X because during the day I don't get to see. You know, my break time is a different break time than 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 that teacher is. So we don't get to collaborate or get together as a group and talk about these. And I think they've cumulatively came up with, hey, this is pretty positive and we think we're having an impact on on students. So although we're we're a year or two kind of away from the COVID impact, they're saying the positive benefits from this are such that we think we should continue. And I I almost liken it to coaching youth, I can keep their attention span and on focus and get a lot of things done in a couple of hours of practice. Too little is not enough and too much is, is too much. And I, my concern of going to the full day is are we really going to, the if we just take the, the inconvenience of families and entirely put that to the side and say, what do we think is in the absolute best interest of students and student uh, achievement and closing any gaps, et cetera. I think that two hours every other week is probably the most beneficial. And I, I think teachers, anytime we've had you up in front, have absolutely said that. The downside is what what I think Brian has received a fair amount of, of concerns about. Um, I haven't. I haven't had, I have not had a single parent talk to me about the concerns of, of early release. Now, on the north side of that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it, right? Closer. Uh, right? And I, and, 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 but I also have middle schoolers now, so the impact has is, is certainly been different of not having not having elementary elementary kids. Now, um, I can see I can see both both sides of it. I I also respect the recommendation of the of, of the staff. The, the challenge is the, the communities continuing to support or not support the idea of every other week, we've got a couple hours that we have to deal with that grandparents, friends, neighbors, kids sometimes staying at school, nobody. whatever it is, sometimes nobody. Right, you know, right. and that, that's, that's where my concern is, yeah. is that we're putting people in that position and kids in that position. And yeah. We don't want to do that. So I'm not I'm not ready to make a decision tonight on this. I don't know if, if you guys are, but no, I I I would like to see this tabled until June mm -hmm. when maybe we can see maybe a condensed yeah, some condensed data. data. Yeah. I know, I know you're like, well, what do you want from me? I, 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 but I can see where Emily's coming from too, or, you know, maybe the newer members need a little refresher on data, maybe even from, from specifically from last year to this year, yes. like last June to this June. Okay. Um, and then some work on some collaboration on some sort of childcare ish, mm -hmm. you know, support staff that may or may not want to stay or how, how, what that could look like? I guess we're at a table. I would highly suggest that, you know, board members talk to as many constituents as possible on it, um, of varying, varying age groups, et cetera. We're going to get some data, but I think that external data is is as important. And, and also talk to, I mean, the vast majority of us sitting up here, I think all of us know some teachers um talk to a few teachers on their the benefits they they see so i think we have to balance all that dean you made a comment that says time becomes less and less i 100 percent agree with you it's life and time become less and less it's true so i get it i mean well, i know you guys are you guys are in the middle and and i recognize that we just we're, we're constantly trying to figure out you know, how do you support the system? And, and the system is continuing. I mean, we, some of us are getting older, but when, when I came home, there, there used to be a person that was there when I came home. And if I didn't bring, matter what time. <laughs> it didn't matter. And, and when I didn't bring home what I was supposed to, they took me back to go get it. Okay. <laughs> And so times are changing and we rely a lot more on the system today than I think we ever have for, for 
children learning. So it's a it's a tough situation. So I appreciate you know. I do think we try to give you guys a second kick if we can. So June it'll be and um, when the calendars come up, when do you have to have them out? Usually we do the calendars like for our two years in December. So the right. calendar can't. will be printed by the June meeting. Before the June meeting? If you're going to want it to start for July dates so of welcome back, the community one that we have mailed, the dates are due to the printer by the end of May. No. Well, what did we do last year? If there was this, well, it's just, it won't, it won't it just prolonged, it just won't get out till the middle yeah. of June or yeah. July. Yeah, we'll just have to push yeah. it back. All right, we're going to table this. Can I, can I just ask for some clarification on what you're asking for? Okay. So I know you want more data, which but I understand that. <coughs> Um, so you're, you're tabling the decision because you want to decide between the two, like, is that, so it's not that it's off the table, you're deciding it's off the table or not. Okay. That's just helpful. in like the information that we you'll get one you. or two. Okay. It's just helpful to know that for the information well, that we bring to you. Yeah. But it's not to say that an option three can't come about. Right. Right. Okay. So, I mean, okay. We would move forward that I think that everybody yeah. is on that page, but we would be able to bring option three and four too. If, sure. If okay. And then when you say child care, do you have any, and maybe this is for like a separate, I don't know if I'm supposed to be able to do this, but mm -hmm. do you have any specific thoughts about um, like when you say like the people that are highest need, because that's a part that we struggle with. Like, how do we say like, well, you really need it. Mm -hmm. So, because I'm, I'm, this doesn't affect me so much, but I'm thinking of like, say, Ophis, mm -hmm. they have 500 some kids. Mm -hmm. So, like, how do we don't have enough support staff that can mm -hmm. watch 500 kids? So, or how, where would you do it? If you're well, also like, having you have thoughts about what that? would some people will say, well, you can send my kids home, I would think. I don't know. Right. But, like, do you have like any thoughts of like as a parent how that could, I don't know. I mean, I know that just, I guess, talking about it in that sense, like I know space, obviously space is an issue there. So good, good point. Um, and if we don't have people that want to stay in care, like that just, that eliminates that right away. But I think as a parent, uh, I don't know, I guess, I don't know if you're asking like for specific ages or specific needs. I just think about my kids, but not everybody, not every kid is on, is my kid. You know, like I could send my, I mean, I'm not going to talk about my kids, but you know, I, I, there's so many different variables that, and I think that's probably the point that you're trying to make is like, how do you figure that out? Like with all the different well, variables. I, just, I mean, it's another thing if we're going to work I, on that and come back to you. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm sure we kind of have what you're thinking in mind. I, I don't think you figure it out for every kid, obviously. I think you have, these are some available options, whether it be care or, you know, maybe there is a kid station type thing, or here's a couple of, couple of available options that allow those families that aren't able to have their kids go home or to, to create some what's, options. What's, that, that, what's, what what's, how is it handled this year? If those elementary, everybody goes home unless they make arrangements with the teacher and the parent to stay there for extra time. Mm -hmm. Well, at, at, oh, at the elementary, they go they home. They just go home. Right Everybody goes home. Everybody's home. Nobody stays. Right. No kids stay. Mm -hmm. And and that's why we're getting the feedback from the community because those kids are the most at risk in, in this situation, and mm -hmm. and they don't have the parents are having to take time off of work, and we know that family stresses then can compound too so that has to be part of our decision going forward also yeah you wouldn't have transportation we wouldn't have drivers to get back to take the second group home that decides to stay yeah. for child care that would require pickup that would require, that would require yeah we require, require pickup outside, outside of ourselves as well because we can only do so much you know right. there isn't a child care there isn't quality child care in this community We've done a lot of work to try to get someone here. We've talked to this, you know, for years. 
and I and I it impacts our kids. It impacts our teachers when the kids come, but we can't solve mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. issue um, at the scale that it might be. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be. I would assume there'd be a lot of, of parents who would want childcare. I know we don't have enough support staff to monitor the need. Yeah. So then it comes yeah. back to how do we how do we say you need it, you don't need it. Like it's getting into kind of a, you know, I, I, I know it's an issue. It's a huge issue in our community and Encompass is coming and that's fantastic, but like Pretty quickly overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just think we have to like also be thinking, I mean, I don't know that we can as a you know I wonder our family, you know, families, potting, I mean, stuff that happened during COVID, like families that, like, I don't know, it's a, it's an issue that we can solve mm -hmm. with our resources that we have. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good, that's a good point too. Mm -hmm. Not yes. over, not continuing to over, overburden. Overburden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we think that, um, is there any plan for continuity that going forward, we plan to do this indefinitely where, I think some parents are kind of waiting with bated breath to see, okay, are they going to do it next year? Are they not? Do I make a plan? Do I not? And if we at some point make the decision to say we're doing this until we're not, do we find that that may help parents with planning, knowing that it's always going to be the first and third Wednesday of the month, always? I don't I don't know, but I'm just yeah. wondering if the uneasiness each year is is perpetuating the issue maybe. You, a you bring bit. up a good point. I I think you should make a decision and that's just what we're doing until we change it. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from maybe what Brian was saying, if we would decide and say, all right, we're going to do something different for a year and test that out and see how that works, then I wouldn't suggest mm -hmm. suggest we do that. But if the consensus is, hey, we're going to stick with what we've been doing, then maybe we would make would make that decision. Because, I mean, at that point, it, all right, it's three years and if we're not going to try something different or we don't think a different option is better then let's just lock lock it in but if we are going to do something different then i i don't i think we would want to let that go a year to determine whether that was as effective or not as effective that's a great point and i'm all for continuous improvement um it it's the best for our kids and our community i mean we have to be continually improving and staying ahead of the next you know but uh again we need I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to measuring sticks. That's just how I am. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Okay, appendix B. So that's the board to consider approving. There's three positions that have come forward. So um, at the middle school, we have an archery club, and this is something that is new. Um, based on one of our staff members, Kyle Christensen, uh, who has put a ton of effort into making this an option for our students. And then another piece is the Performing Arts Center Managing Director. Um, this is based on a teaching need. So in the past, that position has been part of their FTE assignment, um, but now, there is a need for that person to teach another section of a class of students and so it's going to go outside of their regular teaching assignment and then the third is three members of the team at wakana falls elementary who have in the past uh, worked with students as part of a running club and now we're trying to formalize it and make it a paid position so i've worked with each one of the administrators um, to understand kind of what the job description is, what they think the number of hours that are going into this, and then we assign a, a value to it. Um, it's a good starting point, and then we need to do a total scrub on our Appendix B um, probably this summer where we're then trying to calibrate against all of the other positions and I anticipate here in the future bringing Appendix B back to the board just simply because um, one of the items that's later on the, the agenda for tonight is compensation. So you can imagine it doesn't take very many years to go by and, and you probably really need to take a look at 
which are compensation for some of these positions to make them more competitive. So is the archery club at the mill school, you know, more hours and just more involved than the high school one? Is that the reason for the difference? Okay. Yeah, we're basing it right now on a program. Um, Kyle has run a program, I'm thinking this was a Pulaski. It was, yeah. And he essentially, um, he has quite a relationship built up with Lena Swamp Archery. And, he works there too. Um, oh, he does. In the summer, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he is in a situation where he's bringing the equipment, um, the knowledge, X number of years, multiple times a week, taking the kids and giving yeah. them these opportunities. So, okay. I just noticed the difference between the two. So, yeah. I yeah. up so an example would be, you know, we kind of create some of these based on the capacity of the individuals. If Kyle were to at some point decide not to do this in the future, we probably would not be able to run it the way it's being run right Definitely now because yeah. he has got he's a got background. A full that, trailer. He's the amount of equipment that he has in the trailer. Like he's this mm -hmm. taken him two decades to build that up. Probably yeah. we could just cool. turn around next year, and yeah. we're pretty lucky. Is, is there an archery club at the high school? Um, right now, I know that we have it on the books, but I don't even know if, if we've got somebody running it right now. So, I believe we do. Dave oh, also. oh, Dave. Mm -hmm. Is Dave doing it? I so. Yeah. He's in charge. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? So we motion to approve? I would move to approve the motion by Ken. I'll second. Second by Carrie. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Uh, staffing update. So when we had brought you the staffing um, back a few months ago, we had shared with you that um, there was a position that we had decided to hold off on, and that was a secretarial position to support um, both the technology as, as well as, or I should say instructional technology and teaching and learning departments. Um, had a chance to work a little bit more with both Corey and Heather, and they have worked together to create this this rough outline of the job description. And we, I am proposing to you, the board, to consider letting us move forward with this 1.0 FTE. Okay. Dean, is this an hourly position or a salary position? It'd be hourly. And the, I mean, you mentioned it, but budget. Budget will support it. Will support it. Yeah. And just to clarify, make sure I understand this is a, a full year. This isn't just a mm -hmm. school year, nine months, no, 260. I don't remember if it was 260 or less than that. When you think about the, the amount of training that goes on this summer between those two departments, the thought process is they're going to need that person for their support. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just look at how much we do are on the technology side and then how much we're trying to lean into the teaching and learning side. If we think we can move the needle and continue to support and drive greater improvements there. I, I, I think so too. I, you know, the, the, the amount and the quality of, of work done with in both of those areas uh, is, is, is amazing to me. Uh, and so I think that uh, having this type of support would, would uh, definitely allow that to continue or maybe even increase or expand so I would move that we accept this job description and uh, authorize filling that position. I just have a couple more questions. Who, so this person reports to both Corey and Heather? Okay. Correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, where, where will they be located? 
They've had some That's still some under discussion. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a number of discussions about where what would be the best location. Okay. Um, but right now in the high school, it's kind of a shared location between you know between people services, special education, and teaching and learning. Uh, and then where I'm currently housed is at the old middle school. So like you know, we just kind of had some discussions about it. So okay. I'm sure we can find a good spot for. Okay. I'll second the motion. Who uh, did Ken make I it? Okay, mm -hmm. sorry, I missed that. Oops, motion by Ken, second by Emily. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. All right, resignation and retirement requests. So before we get to certified staff, I just wanted to bring to the board's attention. Um, so support staff can be accepted by the superintendent, but I wanted you to be aware. I wanted to honor their, their service. So support staff members that have um, resigned, uh, Megan Norgulis, special education paraprofessional, Washington Middle School, three years of service. And then the remaining are retirees, Diane Rizzo, Custodian at Abrams Elementary, retiring after 17 years of service. Jody Wickman, Library Paraprofessional at Count Falls High School, retiring after 30 years of service. Teresa Stari, Special Education Paraprofessional, Washington Middle School, retiring after 18 years of service. And Lisa Ganyu, Special Education Paraprofessional at Count Falls High School, retiring after 24 years of service. Um, we greatly appreciate their service to our school district and we honor the work that they've done and the impact they've had on our kids. And then also uh, request for retirement, um, certified staff member Chris Seidel. And Chris has 37 years in our school district and Chris is a first grade teacher at O'Connell Falls Elementary School. And thank you to Chris for her many years of service. That one I would ask that you take action upon. Was was it just Chris's time, or did she give any other, you know, anything else you can share, or just thirty seven years? There's, there's thirty seven years for a reason. I actually did have a conversation with Chris. Um, I think that would probably be appropriate for a closed session. Okay. I'm glad that that conversation is happening. 37 years, that's a lot of knowledge. Yes, <laughs> and experience. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And I'm hoping that the others will have those same conversations too with anyone just to guide us in making decisions going forward. Thank you to your service if you're listening. Mm -hmm. yeah. Motion to motion, Brian? <laughs> oh, sure, I'll make the motion then. <laughs> Open my big mouth and make the motion. <laughs> motion by Brian. Second. Second. Oh, second by Chad. Uh, any other discussion? I just wanted to again thank thank um, thank the uh, the support staff and um, Mrs. Seidel. She taught my husband. She taught with my kids. So. Um, <laughs> Definitely gonna gonna miss her. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Contract approvals. Asking the board to consider approving the contracts. Three individuals: uh, Mr. Dan Seaman, um, school psychologist position, Cow Falls Elementary, and Renee Feltz, special education teacher at the high school, and then. Also internally, Ms. Carrie Pansky, uh, English language arts teacher um, for Washington Middle School, and that's an internal move from O'Connell Falls Elementary School. Yeah. Yeah. Motion to approve the new contracts. I'll move. Sorry, was that Sarah? Yeah. Second by Sarah, second by Chad. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carried. Uh, 23-24 staff compensation. 
So, as you are aware, um, the board identified a committee of the board to work together with the certified staff um, relative to nego negotiations around base wage. And went through and you all had the opportunity to be involved in that process. You kept the board as a whole up to speed during that time. Um, and at this point, um, the conclusion of the latest interaction was that the O'Connell Falls United Association ratified the tentative offer that was presented to them, which was a total base wage as defined by the Wisconsin statute um, to be increased by 7.5% for the term of the agreement um, as compared to the total base wage. And we ask that you, the board, consider uh, approving that agreement moving forward. And then also ask you to consider something similar with the support staff employee group. Well, I think our, our, our committee made, uh, uh, is, is making the recommendation to the full board that we accept this. So I would move that we uh, authorize the 7.5 percent uh, increase in base salary for certified staff and also for the uh, support staff. Okay. Motion by Ken. I'll second it. Second by Brian. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion, motion carried. Uh, 23-24 CISA 8 contract. May I just say, did that, is that for both? Groups? Yes, for both. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. So the CISA 8 contract, um, Kim, you probably have the, the most background on this one. Um, what I will say to the board is ultimately the contract is a little bit less than it's been in the past, but can maybe you can talk to some of the specifics. Um, hello. Oh, I'm sleeping. You woke up at the right time. I did. Oh, it's my turn. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, you all have the CISA 8 contract, and the reason that um, we're bringing that to you is because we're asking you to spend 23-24 money. So it hasn't been budgeted, the budget hasn't been approved, and we can't technically go ahead and do that without your approval. So that's why we're here. So the, there's a few things through the year that I will bring to you like that, such as buses, just because we're, we have to buy it so far in advance to do that. But CISA 8 um, provides services um, that we don't have the staff <coughs> and um, this contract here was based on the services that we have today. Now Terry did look over uh, the special ed services which is the bulk of it and we also have um, curriculum instruction and assessment services and those um, uh, Heather had reviewed and we modified a little bit so um, the number the total will stay, but what we'll use those days on, it's mostly related to professional development. So we might make some small tweaks, but overall, um, I think that it'll end up around $502,000 for the entire year. And I believe last year it was just slightly higher. So we don't have an exact amount, but we would like you to do that so they can set the staffing and get uh, the, the people there so we have them next year. 502. 507. 507. 507. Uh, we are going to remove the speech and language line. Oh, okay. okay. Um, that was something we just needed for a short period of time, and I don't anticipate that need next year. Um, so this is the overall contract. We do spend some other monies with CISA 8, but this is uh, to solidify the big services there. So anything else, ladies? <laughs> So I need a motion to approve this. Do you have any questions? Kim, I, yeah, I was wondering, we, the uh, school nurse, it looks like that's not, is that like a fill-in or part-time? Uh, we contract for subbing. Oh, for um, subbing, okay. Yeah, it's been okay. 
because um, we help over in, our two school nurses. We'll have we have we we employ two. Uh, yeah, not two FTEs, but two people. Okay. Um, and what we've done the last couple of years is we've had some a, a nurse from CISA be a, our sub. So if um, you know, Lynette and Brittany can't you know be in for whatever reason, sick mm -hmm. children, sick days, we can at least have a nurse because we need. We need at least one nurse. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's state statute, right? That we have to. No, student need. Student need. Mm -hmm. yeah. And with that person has also provided last year some professional development to, to our newer school nurse, too. So she's kind of a she had some mentoring time in there, like a couple of days to help get her off on a good foot. So it's someone who we have now works through CISA, but had been a, a nurse in our district before. So it works really. Uh, the other question I had was uh, uh, econo uh, education for economic development service. No, that wasn't it. Oh, uh, curriculum instruction and assessment services. Uh, CIA direct services, again, 10 hours. Um, that sounds like it's something that Heather does. <laughs> okay. it's, it's 10 days um, that we contract with. So there'll be one title one day. Um, there's five days supported. Our national board certified teachers are going through national board certification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's five days for that. Um, there's three days related to um, career and technical education and academic and career planning. I don't remember off the top of my head what the 10th day. Oh, it's um, gifted and talented is the template. Okay. So it's really specialized um, professional development okay. days for certain staff. Okay, um, all right. Yeah, the career in tech ed that oh, Carl Perkins, that's doing the bureaucratic work for for um, accessing federal Perkins. funds, right? For, 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 uh, Carl Perkins, Perkins is. Yeah. Um, we have to be part of the consortium because of the amount that we get. So mm -hmm. then this is CISA's eighth okay. um, right. fee okay. to do that. Thank you. Uh, Okay. Looking for a motion to approve. No, we'll approve the CISA contract for 23 24. Ken? I'll second that. Okay. Um, Any other discussion? Right, does it need to be, does it need to be verbiage in there that it's not as it's written because that needs to be? Taken out. Oh, Money yeah. needs to be taken out for. Um, I, if you just approve that the contract, we it shouldn't be more than what you're seeing on this document. So if we provide less, uh, dean can sign it. Then. So you're approving that dean can sign it. To be okay. no more than. To be no more than. No more. Five hundred seven. Okay. Five hundred seven. Yeah, yeah I believe it no. will be less. Five hundred seven. What were you taking out? 507, 880, right. 76. No, but you were saying you one line item. Yeah, there is. A, it technically, I think it should be 502. Um, or the speech and language. Okay. Um, it's a lot of communication with CISA, and I wasn't able to get an updated contract in time. Okay. Um, so 507 being the worst. So that's what you're approving, but if it's less, that's good. Okay. Everybody comfortable? Yes. Okay. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. So Ken motion and second for Emily. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the learning curve. Yeah. Like so uh, so I'm going to be doing notes till at one o'clock. <laughs> Probably. All right. Twenty three, twenty four meal prices. Okay, that's me again. Oh. All right. So uh, every year at this time, uh, we bring to you setting meal prices for the next year. Now. Um, the 22-23 year that we're in right now is actually the first year that we're back to meals having uh, you either are free and reduced or you have to pay because we have the two years of free. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to preface this with saying that you know we're still trying to get back on our feet. How many meals are we going to serve now that people have to pay versus before? And it's really kind of hard to set the, the price. Uh, but just a little information. Uh, there is a document. 
don't know if you want to just. Okay, perfect. Um, so 37% of our student population is free and reduced, and we get a federal reimbursement rate um, for them. So you see in the current year, 22-23, we get for breakfast $2.67 and for lunch $4.33. And um, it's actually currently projected for next year to be lower, but they drag their feet and it might be a while before we know what the reimbursement, but it could potentially be less than what we're getting now and it was less than before. So anyway, that's a challenge. Um, and then the next chart below shows for the 63 remaining um, percent of the population uh, that are in paid status currently. Um, breakfast for all grades is $2. Uh, lunch is $2.85 and middle and high school is $3.10. So in this, I'm um, proposing that we would increase um, just lunch at both at all the levels by a quarter. And that's a recommendation from the state saying we should probably do no more than a, a quarter at a time per lunch meal, just because it might deter some people from uh, not wanting to purchase lunch. And we don't need our counts to go down as well. Um, the next column, the very last one, the 23-24 paid meal federal with federal reimbursements, we, um, this district receives the price per meal plus uh, 34 cents for breakfast and 44 cents for lunch. So if you see those numbers and you see what we're being reimbursed on the, if you're a free student as compared to um, a paid student, it's obviously less. So to be equivalent uh, for lunch, we would have to charge $3.56 per, per paid meal. Um, to get it to be the same as the federal reimbursement rate, which we're not there. Um, so some considerations for 22-23, the food service program does expect to have a loss of approximately $110,000 annually, and that's going to reduce our fund balance. Now we talked about that back when we set the budget, and we're right on track for that. So it was totally expected. Um, we're coming off that year. We knew that meal counts were going to go down and grocery costs are going up. Um, so long term, that's not sustainable. Um, we have higher food costs, supply costs, labor costs, and that's driving that. So the proposed uh, would be to not increase the breakfast prices because the participation is a little bit lower than we'd like it to be uh, right now, and a 25, 25 cent raise for paid lunches, which would result in about $26,000 more revenue annually. So a quarter of the way of the loss that we are experiencing. And Fund 50 has a $280,000 fund balance right now to help us bridge that gap until we can get those prices to a break even level. So we have a few years to figure this out. However, we also need some money set aside because we do have aging equipment. So um, there's kind of a balance uh, there. And on the bottom, you can see the surrounding area meal prices, so this is not out of line. And this is their price this year, so I don't know what they're gonna do, but from what I hear from other business managers, it seems like the, everyone's gonna have to raise meal prices because we're all in the same situation. Um, so this would ask for approval for the yellow column, $2 for breakfast to stay the same, lunch at the elementary school, $3.10, and lunch at the middle and high school to $3.35. Any questions? I'll make the motion. Ken? To approve the meal prices as presented? Right. Second by Chad. Any other discussion? It looks like it drives a, a decent balance um, between not raising too much. And uh, if you look at the surrounding prices and those, and you said those are the current prices, that's not what they have raised or may raise to. And it's given inflationary pressure and just where we're at against the, um, it, it seems pretty reasonable. Thank you for putting together this, this detail as always, Kim. Um, any other comments or discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Food service management company contract. Okay, that's D again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, um, uh, the board had talked about the food service management uh, contract in a full session uh, a couple of months back. A couple months back, but anyway, every five years we we're currently using Tahar as a food service management company, and every five years we have to go back to bid. Um, for the DPI and use this format to request that. And we have to um, send out this bid to all the vendors that the DPI has, which is like 30 plus. So um, this process in, we sent at the beginning of April, this um, request for proposal out to 30 plus vendors. And um, then you go through this timeline and only one showed up, which is Tahar. And only one bid, which is Tahar. So, um, and I got no communication from any of the other ones other than thank you for sending the bid. So I know people got it, but um, uh, only Tucker had a bid. So you have their proposal in hand. Um, in there, I focused in on the financials. Anyway, they are projecting still another loss within this next year. They're showing like I believe ten to twenty thousand dollar loss annually. Will be slightly bigger because we do purchase things from the district that aren't in their budget, but it, again, it's on track with um, where we are planning. We just need to put in the work and figure out how we can uh, get our grocery costs um, kind of in control. So uh, one of the things I do want to point out is in this contract, it's not only the bid, it's the contract. And uh, Tiger has reviewed it and agreed that this, um, they're in, in agreement with all the terms within this contract. And that's something we did have our lawyer review. I just wanted to point that out. So um, what we're recommending is that we would go again with Tahir, um for our food service management company. It's a one-year contract with renewal for up to four years thereafter, and then we'd have to do this process all over again. Um, I think that's it. So any other questions? So with the, with the renewal, we, we could, without penalty, not renew it another second, another year. That is correct. So next year, same time, I would come and say our options would be to renew with them for a term, and they would provide that uh, document, or uh, we could do something else. Is, yeah. it, is it pretty usual that the DPI has a list of 30-some vendors and only one? I mean, is there, there's just not enough food vendors out there to service school districts that yeah, the let, when I started here, I was here for a week and a half, and this was going on, and this was my first experience, and um, you have to have a date where they come on site to visit, and again, uh, her was the only one that showed up. So I, I think it's standard. You know, if you look at a, a different service, like the transportation company, let's say we would want to go and have Lamers be our bus service, we probably, they don't have, probably couldn't even do it. So it they're probably in the same situation. They can't find staff. So I think it's worse now too because you have such an employee shortage, and uh, the the level of their ability to earn dollars in this work it's very mm -hmm. thin. It's a small margin, I guess, is what I was trying to say. Sure. So it's a small margin to begin with, and then your employee capacity is so low right now. Some history, uh, I don't remember how many years ago it was when we, we used to have our own in-house food service when we decided, <coughs> decided to go out and split off the bids like this. I think we had like five companies that bid and they were pretty aggressive. Uh, but once Tahir got it to, after that, then there was very little competition. Like, like a lot of other areas once they put the bid, it's tough for everybody else to outbid them. So that raises this question then, if we're not getting any other options, <laughs> uh, are we satisfied? So there's, so there's been some <laughs> loaded questions. <laughs> yeah. loaded the so there's been some challenges that we're working with Taher the last couple of years. So at this point, we've sat down with Taher and shared with them concerns, and this is their opportunity to address those concerns. Okay. And we so, specifically made some 
adjustments. Adjustments to the contract. Okay. Okay. So it's a wait and see. Okay. <laughs> so we would expect we would expect to come back to you after this year or maybe during the year and at the end of the year to give you an update on how are things going um, so that you're not blindsided by whatever data is there at the end. Okay. Um, so we're giving them a chance to rectify their. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and our food service director, Jenny Fascio and uh, Diane, is, Diane Sear is the assistant. They're phenomenal. I mean, and all the staff at Tire, but I work closely with them and they, they really care and they're uh, doing their best to uh, make this program what it is. So. That's an important delineation between <laughs> when we say Tahir, we don't mean the folks yeah, that sharp, we're interacting right. with yeah. mm -hmm. in-house. Right. We're very appreciative of the work our people are doing. Right. It's more at the, the higher, higher level. level. Okay, need a motion to proceed? Dan, Dan's getting You're tired of the <laughs> <laughs> Motion by, motion by Ken, second by Sarah. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Moves us to a closed session. I move that we convene <laughs> into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statute section 19851 F to consider financial, medical, social, or personal histories. Or disciplinary data of specific persons, preliminary consideration of specific personnel problems, or the investigations of charges against specific persons, which, if discussed in public, would likely be likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data or involved in such problems or investigations. Specifically, the board will to discuss a personnel conduct investigation in Wisconsin Statute Section 19851C to consider the employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee which the board has jurisdiction, especially to discuss individual staff compensation. Second. Second by Ken. <laughs> uh, I'm ready. Sarah, if you can do a roll call, please. Um, Carrie? Yes. Emily? Yes. Ken? Yes. Clint? Yes. Chad? Yes. Brian? Yes. Sarah? Yes. And call it 953. Okay. <laughs> take a very short break. And, uh, <laughs>